an easy victory in Reykjavik, but it wasn't to come. Olivelson, in the 71st minute, scored the first goal for the Icelanders. Poor marking and goaltending allowed Sverison in 77 minutes to make it 2 0. Again, we see poor marking and Sverison slotting the ball home. We see Iceland with four points, and Spain has to play France next with little chance of making the final cuts. Faroe Islands looking for another miracle, but it wasn't to happen tonight. Denmark were on their game. Faroe Islands playing in Malmö, Sweden in front of 2,500 crowd because their ground in the Faroe Islands is not fit for play yet. First goal is a penalty, and Kristoff. Nice. First touch ball in the back of the net to make it 2 0 Denmark, and the route was on the way. Well placed header to make it 3 0. Four nothing into the empty net by Vilnort in the 76th minute. the results in group four and the table. Faroe Island with three points for the one sensational victory they had over Austria. Denmark marching on his way, one point behind Yugoslavia and looking sure favorites to qualify. And an exciting match from the USSR and Hungary in group three. An excellent goal straight in. Hungary scoring first. Penalty is called in the 37th minute. And Chelminko steps up to take the shot. One all. In the second half, shortly asked to the whistle. Poor goaltending and good finishing by the Russians in the 47th minute, making it 2-1. The game ended a tie in the 83rd minutes by Keprich. USSR on top with 10 points. Hungary climbing up to joint second place but goal differences put them down to third. Let's uh, start with our European Championship look ahead and uh, Scotland uh, needing a win tomorrow to go through, are hoping for performances and goals like this in their last European Championship international uh, against Switzerland in Bern last month. That last gasp equaliser by Ali McCoist was vital to the Scots. Their opponents are Romania, and here are the Romanians in action in a friendly match against Spain. It promises to be a really tough match, this, uh, for Scotland, who've plenty of injury problems and have yet to name a side. One thing's for certain, I thought, I think that J Gordon Jury will play up front and is likely to be partnered by Manchester United striker Brian McClare. Well, they're looking at uh, Group 2 in detail. Switzerland still lead. They've played seven games. The remaining matches are Romania, Scotland and Bulgaria, San Marino tomorrow. And then on November the 13th, Scotland are at home to San Marino with Romania taking on Switzerland. And finally, it's Bulgaria against Romania. Well, now let's uh, turn to uh, Group 2. 
and this Yugoslavia uh, in action uh, against Denmark. This the big game, without doubt, the big group. Uh, Yugoslavia, uh, of course, in second place, a point behind the Danes. Uh, the Danes lead uh, with 11 points from seven games. Denmark here, very unlucky not to have scored there, and certainly a team who have every chance of going through from this group. A fascinating match, though, in, in prospect uh, in the 13th of November. Denmark against Northern Ireland and Austria against Yugoslavia. But Denmark marginal favourites from Group 4. Well, group 5, what a game we're going to have uh, tomorrow uh, between West Germany and Wales. And a bit of team news for you. Uh, well, uh, Wales hope to have Dean Saunders and Ian Rush both in the side. Uh, the West Germans haven't actually named a side, but Bertie Voltz has said that Karl-Heinz Riedler and Rudy Voller will play up front. Thomas Dole uh, moving into midfield with Jürgen Klinsmann on the bench. The Germans desperate for a win, the world champions. It would really uh, be a bit of disappointment to them if they were unable to qualify uh, for the championships. And for the Welsh, uh, they, of course, looking to qualify for the first time. Wales have been in marvellous uh, form, of course, uh, recently. And here we're going to see another goal from the uh, Liverpool striker, uh, Dean Saunders. He's been in majestic form for club and country recently. The header on by Rush, the goal from Saunders. And how Wales manager Terry Yorath could do with another goal like that from Saunders tomorrow. There's the standings. Wales uh, in the lead. Four games played, seven points. Belgium in second place with Germany in third. The key game definitely is Germany-Wales tomorrow. And then Belgium against Germany on November the 20th. Wales one game after tomorrow is again home against Luxembourg. Holland, of course, uh, the defending champions. There are no certainties, by the way, to qualify. This game against Portugal. There's a goal from Ajax striker Bercamp. Uh, and that was a marvellous moment for him. He's been in great form uh, for his country. And Marco van Basten scores again here. Uh, and there's no need to, uh, for the introductions here. This was van Basten scoring uh, against Greece recently. Their opponents uh, are, are Portugal. And it's between these two in the group. This was Portugal against Finland. Brito, the scorer there. A narrow but very important win for the Portuguese. Here's the... Uh, uh, group Holland, Portugal, Finland, Greece and Malta in this. Uh, Holland have nine points along with Portugal and the big game is tomorrow. Uh, Greece and Holland, they play on the 4th of December and we've got uh, more action there. England's group next and this was uh, Izmir and uh, England's victory, albeit a narrow one against the Turks last year. And I can tell you that uh, Graham Taylor has decided when naming his team uh, to go with Alan Smith uh, to partner Gary Lineker up front. Brian Robson comes into the team for his 89th cap. Gary Mabbott also plays, and so does David Batty of Leeds. Graham Taylor knows that it's going to be a tough match, and this uh, the uh, highlights from the other game in the group with the, uh, Poland against Turkey. Poland will be looking for the win to put the pressure uh, on England when they take on Northern Ireland, a match that kicks off at 5 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. The group couldn't be tighter. Uh, England uh, against, uh, uh, of course, Poland to come uh, next year. Well, uh, I can assure you that uh, the group is going to be very interesting. England currently lead it six points from four games. Our most varied programme of football on Eurosport this week, starting with two European Championship matches. Denmark are coming with a late run in Group 4. Is it, though, too late to stop Yugoslavia reaching the final? They must play Austria in the Prater Stadium in Vienna, needing victory to keep the pressure on the Yugoslavs. Aside with plenty of British interest, Peter Schmeichel in goal from Manchester United, John Steverback, formerly of United, at uh, fullback, and Kent Nilsson of Aston Villa wearing three. Lars Olsen at four, Henrik Larsson five, Kim Kristoff day six. A lot of players from Bronby, the Danish champions. John Jensen at seven, Kim Vilfort at eight. Then nine, Fleming Paulsen from Borussia Dortmund. Bent Christensen, who also plays in Germany with Schulke. And at 11, Lars Olstrup from uh, Odense. This is the first half with Denmark in the red shirts. Austria, who've had a terrible time in this European Championship. Remember, they began the group by losing away to the Faroe Islands. 
That cost manager Hickensberger the sack, and the team hasn't recovered. Early attack, nevertheless, which finishes with the number 10, Peter Stürger, getting a shot in. Arsenal supporters may remember him as the man whose penalty gave Austria Vienna victory, albeit a rather meaningless victory, in the second leg of the recent European Cup tie. Stürger, the number 10. That was in the same Prater Stadium, of course, and there are just about the same number of people, around about 10,000, who turned out for this championship match. They've given up all hope of Austria in the group. Whereas the Danes have three successive wins going into this one, and they're given a very good start with that awful own goal by Peter Artner. We'll be able to see it again as the ball is crossed in with Vilfort and Povelson uh, putting pressure on the defender but not really enough pressure, you wouldn't have thought, to get a goal out of it. Dropping over the head of Prosenik, the right back, and Artner just can't control his clearance at all. The ball drops into the net, 10 minutes played, Austria nil. Denmark. Not very good defending at all by the Austrians and uh, poor goalkeeper Otto Konrad not able to do much about it. Christian Prosenik, the right back from uh, Austria Vienna, the man who missed the header. Peter Artner's own goal and a bit of cheer for Richard Muller Nielsen on the bench. He took over from uh, Sepp Piontek, remember. And after a bad result when they lost 2-0 at home to Yugoslavia, the Danes have really got back into the group. Six months later, they went to Yugoslavia and won 2-1. So, position going into the group. Yugoslavia played six, ten points. Denmark played six, nine points. Looking for a victory then to take them to the top of the table. And before very long, there's more encouragement for them. An Austrian side uh, really short of confidence, giving the ball away badly here. Fleming Povelson of Borussia Dortmund finishing expertly. It's 2-0 and still only 16 minutes played. Name often written as Poulsen, in fact, uh, spelt with a V, but however you spell it, this wasn't a bad old finish, was it? Left foot, beating the goalkeeper at the near post. Perhaps Conrad in goal might have made a better fist of it, but uh, Austria paying the penalty for having given the ball away within 30 yards of their own goal. So, barely quarter of an hour gone, the Austrians two down in front of their own supporters, but it's become a very good night already for that little travelling band. Crowd, understandably, beginning to get at the Austrian team as well. They're not very happy. Paulson creating more trouble with that cross from the right. Pattern of the play evident from these highlights. Though we're still in the first half hour of the game here, a lot of uh, Danish pressure already and Austrian attacks really confined to breakaways, and that is Bent Christensen, who smacks in the third, winning generous applause from the crowd. Bent Christensen of Schalke. Once again, the Austrians getting themselves into trouble. It's uh, Prosenik again, the number two, who lost it. Nice cross, and what a good finish.
So not much doubt uh, ever that Denmark were going to win this one and go to the top of the table in their group. It's really just become a matter of uh, a little bit of self-respect for Austria. Michael handling that one comfortably. Poor Alfred Riedel, the coach, knows he's in big trouble. Henrik Larsson, the blonde number five, who set up the third goal for Christensen. Really doing as they like, even in the Austrian penalty box. Play allowed to go on by the referee. Another chance falling for Kim Wilfurt. It looked very much like the post which presented, prevented a fourth goal even before half-time. Seven John Jensen losing out that time to Herzog. Remarkably for a comparatively unsuccessful country, uh, all the Austrian players drawn from home clubs. The uh, top Vienna and uh, Graz clubs. Schneiderter coming on just at the start of the second half for his debut in international football, replacing Schertl, but still the ball moving towards the Austrian goal much of the time. Povelson setting up John Jensen. Another chance and astonishingly header off the line this time prevents the fourth goal. Johnny Mulby, a substitute on for the Danes, a younger, rather slimmer version of Jan. That was the chance which was uh, acrobatically headed off the line. But here Riedler and his team in big trouble. Well, it could have been six, couldn't it? Lars Elstrup, with all his experience, making a mess of that one. And knows he ought really to have done better. Just screwed it very badly across the face of goal, and the expression on his face says it all. They really don't need to be too anxious on that bench. Rare Austrian attack, not getting anywhere, and just setting up another Danish break. Hovelsen again, look at his pace and strong running. In fact, had the Danes taken all their chances, the final scoreline doesn't really bear thinking about. Could have been almost as embarrassing as losing away to the Faroe Islands. Austria did uh, manage to beat them 3-1 in the home tie, by the way, but that was a very little consolation. They couldn't beat Northern Ireland either, drawing 0-0 at home to them. And next week, they go to Belfast for the away leg against Billy Bingham's Northern Ireland team. Are Denmark going to the finals in neighbouring Sweden, though? That's uh, the real question to be answered. Number seven, Andy Ogris of uh, Austria Vienna, who also played against Arsenal, looking a fairly forlorn figure as his shot was saved there. Denmark, one match left at home to Northern Ireland, and you would certainly expect them to win that on the 13th of November. So that, with the win here, would give them 13 points. But unless they put a lot of goals past Northern Ireland, and they might be ruining all these which got away. Shot against the bar by Mulby. 
unless they beat Northern Ireland by a lot, you would expect Yugoslavia to have the better goal difference in the end. So what it really comes down to is that Yugoslavia will need three points from their final two away games against the Faroe Islands and Austria. So the match that will really decide the group will be Austria against Yugoslavia. In fact, very shortly after this game, Austria's coach Riedel was sacked. So yet another coach will come in. And Denmark must hope that he can inspire Austria to beat Yugoslavia, who do, of course, have big political problems throughout the country. But there was no doubt about that result. Artner's own goal, then Povlsson, then Christensen. Should have been a lot more goals, and that's the position. Denmark, remember, to play Northern Ireland at home. You'd have to say they'll finish with 13 points. So Yugoslavia really needing three points from away games with the Faroes and Austria. More European Championship coming up. Stay with us for Finland and Greece. So we've seen Denmark beat Austria 3-0 to throw Group 4 wide open with Yugoslavia in the Olympic Stadium Helsinki. Just 5,000 people turned out to see Finland, who are out of the running against Greece, who are really the dark horses in a group topped at the moment by Holland and Portugal. The position complicated by the fact that Holland and Portugal have both played six games, from which they've got nine points. Greece have played only three and got four points from those. They beat Portugal at home by three games to three goals to two, an excellent result. So uh, a win here in Helsinki would put them in quite an interesting position. They'd be on six points with uh, still a couple of games in hand. This is the second half of the game with Greece in blue, kicking from left to right, this is Greece in possession, Finland in their traditional white shirts. Not too much of a colour clash to prevent uh, the Greeks turning out in blue and white as opposed to white and blue. Finland as ever with uh, a good mix of players playing abroad in their neighbouring Scandinavian countries, as well as uh, Belgium notably. Fairly uneventful first half but it uh, got more interesting straight from the start of the second with the uh, Borbokis clipping that shot wide for the Greeks and understandably cross about it fun through pass which caught the finished defense square of course they just couldn't see the ball coming in the mist but whatever Borbokis should really have scored The Olympic Stadium in Helsinki, where Finland have made life difficult for a number of much bigger footballing countries in recent years. They held Holland here, 1-1. The Dutch uh, playing very badly and quite pleased to get away with a 1-1 draw. They'd beaten Malta here 2-0 and they drew here 0-0 with Portugal. But any chances of really joining the leaders in the group uh, went with their away defeats by Holland 2-0 and by Portugal 1-0. Greece having the better of this one at the start of the second half. Interesting to know quite how much the uh, sparse crowd could see of the game when the ball was on the far side from them as well, probably just as well that the Finns were in white shirts. <laughs> Early corner for them anyway, for uh, Vurarela to take. And when they eventually get the ball, it will prove to be an interesting corner. Russian referee, Kusainov. Getting the ball at last. Oh. 
Varela, number eight, who plays for HJK. Swing the corner in with his left foot. And when he does, bounces off the top of the bar. Looking very much as if it came off the defender's head. Three, Heikkinen, and nine, Ukonen, causing trouble at the near post there. This time, Saganis, the goalkeeper, has to turn it over. Nikolos Saganis. So the Finns happy to stick to the same tactic, putting a lot of men on the near post. Ari Hell, number 11, is there too. And this time, it pays dividends. Five minutes into the second half. Kari Ukenen, who plays uh, in Belgium for Antwerp, gets his head to it. The Greeks can't say they weren't warned, can they? One which hit the bar, one the goalkeeper just turned over. But uh, very accurate corner kicking from Vurela, really illustrating that uh, balls played into that near post are always likely to cause problems for defenders, even when it's not quite as foggy as this. Ukonen then who got the touch, 50 minutes played, Finland 1, Greece 0, which prompts the first Greek substitution. Borbokis coming off after that bad miss early in the second half. So any hopes which Greece have of catching Holland and Portugal beginning to fade a little. Sarganis comes racing out for that one and doesn't actually get it and that could have been an awful moment if the ball had been picked up by Littmann and the number seven. Helm the number 11 and Varela, eight, whose corners were causing such trouble. And Helm rather wasting the final pass. Greeks highly unpredictable, but uh, they have been to European Championship finals, of course. Notably, 84 in France, wasn't it? Always liable to get good results at home in front of some very passionate crowds in uh, Athens or Salonika or wherever they choose to play. But they really would have expected and needed to win this one in Helsinki. That would certainly have added an extra dimension to the uh, equation at the top. Holland, Portugal, the critical fixture coming up soon in this group. So the Greeks having to come forward and look for an equaliser. Got the extra man here. Santakis, the number 11. But the cross going just beyond their players comes back in. And Charloukidis is all on his own to whip in the equaliser. Celebration suggesting they've qualified already. It's not quite like that. That's the substitute Athanasiadis. And Charloukidis. Pardon my Greek pronunciation. Somehow manages to keep it down and just beat Houdinen under the bar. So that was 73 minutes. There were 17 left for Greece to get a winning goal that they badly needed. 
with the mist getting worse and worse. An interesting last period for those able to see it. There's a ball in there somewhere. And the Greeks, understandably, powering men forward to the end, but unable to get the win, which they really wanted. So a 1-1 draw, the two second-half goals. And that's the position with Holland to play Portugal in Holland, which really should give them the advantage they need. Greece, uh, even darker horses now, despite all those games in hand. And Malta just making up the numbers. That's the European Championship. It's Germany against the rest of the world next. At the Prater Stadium in Vienna, Austria. Group four match between Denmark and Austria. Here's an own goal by Peter Outner to make it 1-0 to Denmark in the 10th minute. Denmark's first match against Austria was 1-3-0. Austria really has to do a lot of work to come back now. Only 10,000 people showed up in Vienna for this match. Denmark's Fleming Paulsen scores in the 16th minute to make it 2 0. Paulsen's a player for Dortmund. At this point, things were working against Austria. Things were looking very bleak for them. We see another look at Paulsen's goal. Here's a nifty play by Henrik Larsen, who takes the ball away and sets up this great pass to Bengt Christensen in the 37th minute to make it 3-0. And its main opponent in Group 4 is Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia still has two matches to play, while Denmark has only one more match against Northern Ireland. Alfred Riedel, the Austrian head coach, quit after this disappointing loss to Denmark. Final score, 3-0, Denmark. in a friendly match between Hungary and Belgium. Played in Hungary. Belgium's Mark Emmers scores in the seventh minute. This is the second match for Belgium under new coach Van Himst. Belgium's in the same group with Germany and Wales. Bertie Fuchs, the German coach, was there to see them play. Here, Enzio Schifo makes a goal in the 75th minute. He's their big goal scorer. 2-0, Belgium. In another friendly, Switzerland against Sweden at the Almen Stadium, 23,000 people capacity. Only 7,300 people showed up. First goal there by Japvesa. Both teams are preparing for important matches which take place next week for the European Championship qualification. Here's a goal by Hare. Make it 2-0 to Switzerland. There's the Swiss coach, Uli Stelicke. Here's another goal. Turk Yilmaz. Sweden doesn't have to qualify for the European Championships next year as they are the host nation. And here's a great goal by Jan Eriksson. Three one Switzerland.
Marching out against Turkey, England expected goals. Several of the old guard were back, but not even the return of Brian Robson, looking strangely out of place at the rear of the team, could inspire Graham Taylor's side. And it comes back again to Pierce. Now Smith's in there as well, and Platt. Oh, and Smith comes in, and even the infants. Alan Smith, 21 minutes. And it was well made by Stuart Pearce and full marks to him. It was the second cross that he delivered in a matter of seconds and it had power and pace and direction and centre forwards thrive on these. This is Unal. Good effort. Oh, hit against the bar from Woods, I think. Probably got a touch to it, Chris Woods. If so, it was a fine save because Unal struck that well. While the fingertips of Chris Wood saved England from further embarrassment, for Packy Bonner it was a totally different story. And that after such a promising start for the Republic of Ireland in Poland. The bra for Cascarino, who was onside. Sheedy just behind him, so too is Staunton. This is Sheedy. Good cross, McGrath! The Republic of Ireland take the lead in Poznan. Merciac to Gilbert. Gifted little player on the ball, but uh, I feel for him really to be effective, he needs to do it further forward, and this is the area where he can be dangerous. Gilbert's cross blocked. Tries again. Support for him from Leschak. And coming in at the back. And hooked away, and then back in, and it is now one all, and the Irish have been caught. Oh, that's a tremendous shot from Townsend. The Irish strike back. Irwin to take the fifth corner that the Republic have had. Put into the net by Cascarino, and it is now 3-1. Jobert trying his luck on the right flank. Most of his time on the left. He's got such skill. Not enough to get past two defenders there. That's easy, that's 3-2. There's no offside flag, and Furtok has got a goal with still 13 minutes remaining. And it is now 3-all. Bonner absolutely flat out as the Poles strike again. We've scored three goals. We and we've drawn. I mean, we've never given three goals away it, since I went to the club. So I went to Ireland. Three goals usually takes about a month, uh, well, a year for people to get that against us. One game to go, perm any one from three. But one point for England in Poznan is enough to qualify. For Wales and Neville Southall, it was the day of reckoning in Nuremberg, but the Germans were irresistible. This time played short to Dole. And this is Muller. Kohler. Mateus. Oh. Maguire to cover. And he was fortunate to take it away from Muller. Oh, and he's trying to give it back to Southall. And that's a terrible mistake. And that is a disaster. And that has... Well, it was going to be difficult for Wales. And now at 2-0 down, look at this back pass. It's completely unnecessary. He just chipped it up in writingly for Rudy Voller to head his 41st goal as a German international. But play waved on here, no offside given. Riedler's in the middle, here he is. 3-0.
and it's all over before we reach our time and the space that was allowed down that left side was just too much Riedler came to meet the cross a powerful header wide of Neville Southall and Wales in disarray Saunders Horn oh, and that was uh, Thomas Dawley was kicked by Dean Saunders and Wales are just getting a little bit reckless they've come out all fired up at the start of the second half and that's a red card for Dean Saunders sent off in his 29th international for Wales Muller now to Hessler Muller wants it back again when the Gascoigne transfer was delayed by the Tottenham players injury has scored Germany's four 72 minutes gone and it's something of a rout 4 forward for Wales chipped up by Bowden Bowen back to Rush it was bundled over and as he pointed at the spot penalty to Wales Ian Rush was pushed over it was laid back to him there by Mark Bowen and it was Effenberg the substitute who bundled Rush in the back and Wales have a penalty and it's Paul Bowden who'll take it he scored a penalty in the friendly against Iceland and he scores for Wales with six minutes left now. And that at least has put a little bit of respectability on the scoreline. Wales still leading Group 5, though, but the final outcome is now in German hands. Unbeaten Scotland went to Romania with high hopes of a first appearance in the finals, but once again it could be so near, but so far. Everdonian coming out on top again. Feeds Jury. Who looks for Gallagher? Who is unlucky? So Dimitrescu is on. We've had all four substitutes. And hand it was by Jury to turn the ball away from the oncoming Michael Klein. And a penalty has been given. The long cross to the far post. They were fully stretched. And the hand turned it away. Can the hands of Gorham do the same? Jorge Haji, the crowd on its feet. Romania lead, 1-0. In Sofia, Bulgaria showed some wonderful technique and individual flair as they beat San Marino with ease. The move leading up to San Marino defender Valentini scoring an own goal was quite superb. Stoichkov then added a second from a penalty before a short corner led to Bulgaria's third four minutes before half time. Attractive skills again in the setup, but a goalkeeping error made it easy for Yankov to score. San Marino's nine men defense then held out until a clever chip was controlled by Ilyev on his chest. The finish was even better. Bulgaria four, San Marino nil. As for the situation in Group 2, for the Scots to qualify now, they must hope they win well against San Marino next month and that group favourite Switzerland lose in Bucharest. Northern Ireland manager Billy Bingham knew qualification was beyond his side, but victory over Austria in Belfast was to be a boost to morale. Black will probably swing this one in. Good header, good goal, Ian Dowie. That's his first goal for his country. What a beautiful free kick. And a quite exquisitely placed header for Ian Dowie. 1-0. Tiger. Worthington. Just a little bit of room for Worthington. Picks out Dennison. 
and he's done well to get past Liner. Worthington. Good looking cross. Dennison still. Dennison! Black! Robbie Dennison have done so much hard work on that far side. He really didn't give up at all. Threw his body at it, really. And a nice finish for Kingsley Black. His first goal for his country, too. Gaga. And that's not a bad ball for Hartman. Keglovitz. Goal. The fullback has done it. Liner. Yugoslavia are the new favourites for qualification in Group 4, though. The Faroe Islands provided only limited resistance. Vladimir Jugovic, the scorer, and Yugoslavia stayed in charge. But the match, especially their second goal, 11 minutes from the end, was a triumph for Red Stars' Savicevic. One of the quality goals of Wednesday night, and how the home countries could have done with such a finish. Yugoslavia hoping to prove a surprise force in Sweden. To be almost certain of getting there, they need just a point in Austria in November. Holland knew victory over Portugal would put them in the driving seat in Group 6. Only one goal, but a beauty. A lovely strike from Richard Vichka with enough power to beat Portuguese keeper Bayer. So the reigning European champions are now favourites to qualify, but with four games still to play, Greece may yet have a say. For France, the worries about qualification are over. Last Saturday, Spain were put in their place in Seville. A Luis Fernandez volley early on was the inspiration the French needed. Fernandez a scorer when France beat Spain in the 1984 European final. And by half-time, France's seventh victory out of seven in their group matches was virtually certain. France, under Michel Platini, looking a significant force again in European football. And the finishing of Jean-Pierre Papin is one of the reasons. Two goals in four minutes from which the Spanish were never to recover. No wonder the French are amongst the top scorers in Europe. Spain did get one back following a free kick. Abelardo making his header count, but it was France's night. Czechoslovakia's victory over Albania on Wednesday in the same group was academic, though Karol Kula wouldn't agree. The Czechs won up early on and consolidating their lead before half-time. The Albanians in white remain one of Europe's weakest footballing nations, and at times they were overrun. The Czechs' second goal following a move the length of the pitch the finish from Ludovic Lantz. Yeah! Having conceded 21 goals in seven games, the Albanians at least had the consolation of a successful free kick by Mijani before the end. But Group 1 belongs to France, the only team in Europe with a 100% record. In Moscow at the weekend, the Soviet Union and Italy drew 0-0. Walter Zenga's fine save from Chernyshev kept the Italian goal intact in the first half. But after the interval, the visitors looked the more likely scorers, and there were audible sighs of relief from the 92,000 crowd as Rizzitelli's shot hit the woodwork. Frustration for Italian manager Vicini, he's since been sacked, because the unbeaten Soviets now need just one point from their final game in Cyprus to qualify. Italy and Vicini will be missing in Sweden. The French had never won in Seville, nor had anyone else for that matter. But playing in white, France went ahead after 12 minutes. Louis Fernandez taking off to volley a brilliant goal. Fernandez played in the French side that won the European Championships in 1984. They went to the semi-finals of the World Cup in 82 and 86, but since then haven't really figured. But now, under Michel Platini, they look like they could do well in Sweden. Marseille's Jean-Pierre Papin made it 2-0 three minutes later. His form for France on Marseille confirms he's one of Europe's most talented strikers. Spain pulled a goal back, Vasquez curled the free kick away from the French keeper Martini, Abelardo scored, but it wasn't enough to stop the French. With seven out of seven, they move impressively into next year's finals, and beaten in 18 now, and this afternoon's result, Czechoslovakia 2, Albania 1, academic. There was much throwing around of Italian arms in Moscow, where Italy, in blue, needed to beat the Soviet Union to survive in Group 3. But the Italians couldn't quite coordinate themselves. 
Rizzitelli missed the first half chance and that created more frustration. In the second half, Italy had the better of things. Rizzitelli hit the post, but luck was with the Soviets. It ended nil-nil. Already Italian coach Vicini has thrown in his hand and resigned. Italy out, so is he. It leaves the Soviet Union needing only a point from their last game in Cyprus to guarantee qualification. Looking at the table and the Cypriot goals against column, they have a good chance. And a Group 6 game in Rotterdam tonight. 50,000 saw the reigning European champions, the Netherlands, in orange, beat their nearest challengers, Portugal, with a great strike from Richard Witschke after 20 minutes. The defensive header out of the penalty area, hammered straight back by Witschke. Victor Bayer got a hand to it, but couldn't stop it. Ray Stubbs with that summary, and uh, that win for Holland makes them odds-on favourites to qualify from that. Irren sich nur 8000 Zuschauer zum letzten Länderspiel des Jahres ins Stadion. Es hatte nur Bedeutung, weil Österreich den Dänen hätte Schützenhilfe leisten können mit einem Erfolg gegen Jugoslawien. Eine Möglichkeit der Österreicher gleich zu Beginn durch Westertaler. Aber in der Folge sind die Jugoslawen eigentlich nur eine serbische Auswahl, die ganz klar dominierende Mannschaft. Überragend Savicevic. Der hier auch den Führungstreffer durch Lukic einleitet. In der 18. Minute also 1 zu 0 für die Gäste durch Lukic. Lukic löst sich geschickt nach diesem Pass von Savicevic und Wolfgang Knaller im Tor der Österreicher ohne Chance. Noch einmal. Das 2 zu 0 durch den besten Spieler auf dem Platz, durch Savicevic, ist die geradezu logische Folge. Diesem Tor geht allerdings ein fürchterlicher Fehlpass von Herbert Gaga voran. Savicevic nützt diese Möglichkeit zum zweiten Treffer. Hier noch einmal dieser Fehler von Gaga. Schöner hätte Savicevic auch von einem Mitspieler nicht angespielt werden können. Das 2 zu 0. Und die Länderspielsaison endet so, wie sie begonnen hat, mit einer grenzenlosen Enttäuschung. Grund zum Jubel haben nur die jugoslawischen Fans. A month later, England followed the Republic of Ireland to Poland. A draw or a victory would take them to the finals. Defeat would let in the Poles, who somehow survived a chance to England newcomer Andy Gray. His shot buried itself into the side netting instead of providing England with the lead. 32 minutes in and against the run of play, Poland scored. A controversial free kick was awarded in midfield. Roman Suarczyk took it and the ball deflects off Gary Mabbott and skids inside the left-hand post. Suarczyk was delighted. The fact that it owed just about everything to the luckless Mabbott didn't matter. Taylor knew the significance of the goal. It meant Poland were for the time being top of the group. For 45 minutes, Poland clung on to their lead. England's strength and spirit are envied by every other footballing nation. They attacked again, but this time Jeff Thomas was narrowly wide. Arsenal's David Rocastle was the next player to try his luck. Again, Poland survived. This time it was fullback Srapacek who cleared for a corner. Andy Sinton, another new cap, took the corner on the right hand side. Platt gained possession and panicked the goalkeeper. But Mabbott's header dropped just over the crossbar rather than beneath it.
Poland, having weathered the storm, began to create attacks of their own. This second half raid nearly ended in a second goal for Poland, when Kozetsky tumbled along with goalkeeper Chris Woods. Fortunately, referee Forstinger stood firm and waved away the protesting Poles. Television replays didn't convince the Poles, but it was the Austrian referee's verdict which mattered. Time was running out when England forced yet another corner on the right. Rocastle took it. Mabbott headed on. And it was Lineker who volleyed into the net from two yards. Twelve minutes remain. England had beaten Poland on their way to the 1990 World Cup finals. Now they'd pick them for a place in Sweden. The group ended in mathematical confusion. Scotland's last match was against San Marino. They needed as many goals as possible in case Switzerland or Romania or Bulgaria pulled level on points. Ten minutes had gone when Paul McStay made it 1-0. All the pressure came from Scotland. San Marino had one aim to keep the scoreline down. But they conceded corner after corner. Scotland responded by pushing everyone forward. And from this corner, Richard Goff heads a second goal. On the rare occasions when San Marino moved a few yards outside their penalty area, they appeared to enjoy prodding the ball around. When they lost possession, they were punished by Gordon Dury. Scotland might have scored nine or ten goals, but luck wasn't with them, although this was to prove their biggest win under Roxburgh's management. In the event, they had to be satisfied with just four. McStay created the last goal for McCoyst. A week later, when Romania failed to beat Bulgaria, this goal proved the final key to qualification. Scotland finished just a point clear of both Switzerland and Romania. Scotland are overdue success. This is La Catouche. Saval goes on, chance here, and it's in, but it's, it's not going to count. Flags up. There was an offside being given, and the Romanians are going to protest how they'll interpret between Romanian and Danish, I'm not sure. That's the look, says it all. Now, let's have a look here. Savar is the eight. This is Lakatouche. And there's no oh, the problem was Radu Choyu towards the top of the picture. He was offside. Savar was fine. Put the ball in the net, but it doesn't count. Break on here for Bulgaria. This is uh, Stochkov. The steel ball wasn't good enough. The Romanians will break again. Very much the pattern of this first half, but still no goals to show. But now Radu Choyu, Lakatush in the middle, if he can find him, he's gone down, penalty! Mr. Mickelson, having denied them a goal with the offside, had no doubt about that one. Mikhailov bringing down Radu Choyu. Does he get a touch? Yes, he did. Caught his ankle. It was man or ball, and it was the man he got. So, Haji. Scored something like half a dozen times from the penalty spot for Romania. Oh, but not this time. Mikhailov has saved it. And Haji has missed the penalty. And it's still nil-nil. Oh, well, well. He kick given. Oh, was uh, by Sabah, but here's the man who can hardly believe what has happened to him. I remember him putting one against a post against Holland in a friendly a few years ago, but that was just too close to the keeper. Triakov. And then Stoichkov. That's the man coming in here with Balakov. Oh, crossfield, nothing forward, nothing penetrative. 
Shirokov forward. And Penneth must have been fouled there, been given anyway, just outside the box. Penneth, who plays for Valencia. Oh, yes, very nearly had his shirt taken off. So, free kick just outside the box. Costadino, caught by Lung. Not sure whether that was going over or not. Lung is so tall. Let's have another look. Costadino will uh, hit it with the left foot. Might just have dipped under. Romania again. Uh, Hadji going through, he's fouled. Closing the ranks through the middle, and there really wasn't a route for him. I'm sure the bench have said that he's got to be stopped, but they won't want him stopped like that, this close to the edge of the penalty area. Lakatush took the uh, free kick and wasted it. That was uh, Popescu, and I think that was Yadu Choyo. Here's Popescu! The little fullback has done it! Where Haji failed from the spot, Adrian Popescu, in only his fourth international at the age of 31, has broken the deadlock. Hugs and kisses, and how well he does. He played that wide, Haji scooped it up. Popescu just keeps running. Turns up here, nobody's expecting him. Popescu pops up and pops the ball in. 1-0. This is Sabao. Nothing through the middle. There's Muntiano coming in again. Good effort and a good save too. And certainly uh, Mikhailov has earned his corn. But the attackers had all come into the middle, drawn the defenders in. Muntiano had a clear run, difficult angle, but he was on target. Seems to have been a rather more determined air about the Bulgarians in the second half, but no real penetration still. A lot of international goal scorers in their side, but they've done very little in the Romanian penalty area. And now what they can do here, here's Sirikov, and it's a goal, it's an equaliser from Sirikov. Put in by Stoichkov, and the teams are level. Now that doesn't affect Romania a great deal because they just needed to score two whether they were going to win 2-0 or 2-1 but the psychology will certainly change with Sirikov scoring time ticking away and no pressure of course on Mikhailov to hurry things up long and high from the Bulgarian goalkeeper Sirikov Oh. And that could have gone anywhere. There was a deflection. I think it may have been off Lupescu, but Sirikov hit it well. And could have been thinking there about his second goal, and that would have put the lid on it for Romania. Just the outside of the foot. I think it was Lupescu. Stoppage time here, and it really has all gone wrong for Romania. Having removed Switzerland last week, they've now only themselves to blame for not going through the door they'd prized open. They've left it instead for Scotland. And there is the final whistle, that's it. It's one all between Romania and Bulgaria. Sirikov's goal in the end wasn't important. It was Haji's miss from the penalty spot that prized out Romania and sent Scotland to Sweden in the summer. Is there's confirmation of it. Scotland win the group by one point. They're in the European Championship Finals for the very first time. Well, the prospect of Wales qualifying for the European Finals was also in others' hands. They needed Belgium to beat the world champions Germany. The match in Brussels, Tony Gubber, the commentator. Muller. Oh, it's a break down the right. It's a good break as well. That came off the defender and just over the bar. Another corner. And Belgium were really caught then by that quick break down the right, right by Stefan Reuter. Andreas Muller will take it short. Well, Prudhomme thought about coming and changed his mind, and it's in. Germany have scored. Rudi Voller has given Germany the lead with 16 minutes gone.
when that cross came over, Prudhomme started to go back and then decided he got no chance. I think he thought he was going to go behind and let it go. But it was played back and Voller scores his 42nd goal for Germany. And that was a good ball. Crossed by Buffin. Oh, and it's loose in the penalty area. Can somebody tee it up? Schiffo to Emmers. And there was uncertainty and hesitation then in the German defence, and maybe the pitch played a part in that, because it's very sticky and very heavy. And that's a good bit of football by Emmers. And the cross was blocked. It's a corner to Belgium. What a good bright start to the second half by Belgium. Really heavy rain here in Brussels. Taken by Valen. And it's still there. Emmers, is it? Oh! It was just a little bit too high for the captain, George Grum, to get on the end of. Grum is on his own there. It's just a little bit too high for him to get good contact with. Oh, two tackles diving in as well. Buffer who dived in and didn't get it. Shots from long range. It was always going wide. Albins. This is Riedler. We've seen very little of the German attack in this first 15 minutes or so of the second half. It's been all Belgium. That's Schifo. Emmers. Oh, lovely little back heel by Albert. Emmers, he didn't get any power in the shot. But again, a quick, incisive attack by Belgium. And if they could just get a goal here and make it level, well, what a transformation we might see then. How nervous might Germany become because they've got to get a draw. Schifo knocks it forward. And that's a good break. This is Buffin. Oh, he's got around the marker as he and was then brought down. I think he was. It looks like it must be a yellow card. Buchwald. And Guido Buchwald becomes the third German player to be cautioned in this match. And that's an indication of the pressure that Belgium have put them under for the last few minutes of the first half and all 20 minutes of this second. It's a great save. Ildner must have seen it late. De Gleiser who hit it. First time from the edge of the penalty area. And Ildner had a late view of that and he did well to smother it. Oh, he's got away. Space here for the cross. Oh, it's taken beautifully. Fine save by Prudhomme. Voller so close to his second goal, he took that really well. And that was a fantastic save by Prudhomme. And that would have been for Wales and it for Belgium if that had gone in. That would have been 2 0. <laughs> Only as far as Valen. And at times, Germany's defence can be made to look a little bit ragged. Valen knocks it forward. And again, he's getting on the end of everything, the young 18-year-old. Only as far as Grun. Germany are really squeezed back in their own half. Vilmots for Emmers. Emmers. And hit a little bit too long. Well, you saw there why Rudi Voller has got 42 goals for Germany. Well, the athleticism was terrific to get his foot on there. Space now for Schifo is the Buffer into the penalty area, nicked away by Riedler, corner. Three minutes left. And Borkelmans to take the corner.
Only as far as Shifo lifts it back in. It's number three, Albert, onto the top of the net. Maybe he had more time than he realised, and maybe it was difficult to get it airborne in that really tacky goal mouth. Hildner came and changed his mind, realised he wasn't going to get far enough. He wasn't really under much pressure, number three, Philippe Albert. The Belgians' last chance, it was 1-0 to Germany. It means now they only need to draw with Luxembourg in their final match to prevent Wales from qualifying. First, Thomas and Wright waiting to come in from behind. That's Mark Wright. Shearer! There's more to come. Here's Shearer. Lineker's in the middle, being joined by Nigel Klopp here. Good volley. Lineker off the bar again. In. Lineker fini finishing it off, but Nigel Klopp. Sprawdzali formę innego uczestnika finału w Szwecji, reprezentacji Anglii. Wyspiarze zagrali w mocno osłabionym składzie. Rezerwy Grahama Taylora nie spisywały się jednak najlepiej, a mimo to udało się im wywalczyć remis 2-2. Przez większą część meczu przeważali gospodarze, ale grali wyjątkowo nieskutecznie. W Pradze piękne bramki przeplatały się z takimi, które paść nie powinny. Udany powrót do reprezentacji zanotował Józef Chowanec, grający do niedawna w PSV Eindhoven, a obecnie znów w praskiej Sparcie. Z jego podania z Kutra wystrzelił pierwszą bramkę, drugą Chowanec strzelił bezpośrednio z rzutu rożnego. Nie popisał się jednak przy tym bramkarz Zeman. Anglicy remis zawdzięczają wspaniałemu strzałowi Kełna. W innych środowych spotkaniach Holandia pokonała Jugosławię 2-0, Węgry, Austrię 2-1, Irlandia, Szwajcarię również 2-1, Szkocja zremisowała 1-1 z Finlandią. Tradycjonsreichen Budapester Nebstadion, sehr konzentriert Ernst Happel, neben ihm Dietmar Konstantini. Und auch hier neben uns Dietmar Konstantini, der mitkommentieren wird. Ernst Happel sehr konzentriert. Er versucht, seine Kraft und seinen Willen auf die Mannschaft zu übertragen. Und die spielt am Anfang sehr gut. Ja, die Mannschaft hat in der ersten Halbzeit sehr, sehr gut gespielt. Chance von Polster nach Freistoß Stöger. Es war natürlich jeder gespannt, wie das erste Länderspiel vom Trainer ausgeht. Übrigens auch erstes Länderspiel von Imre Jena, dem ungarischen Coach. Es sind sehr viele Österreicher nach Ungarn gekommen und wollten halt uns gewinnen sehen. Erste Halbzeit hat es gut Ausgeschaut eigentlich nach einem Sieg, was man da sieht, die Offsets fallen hat nicht geklappt bei den Ungarn, der Toni macht das 1 zu 0 knapp vor der Halbzeit. Und zweite Halbzeit sind wir da körperlich dann zurückgefallen. Aber wir schauen uns dieses Tor noch einmal an. Der Schiedsrichter aus Polen, Liskiewicz, hat richtig entschieden. Gutes Abspiel im richtigen Moment von Peter Stöger. Und in der 40. Minute das 1 zu 0, das war auch der Pausenstand. Und dann, ihr habt vorher Kondition gemacht, unerklärlich ein Rückfall. Die Ungarn ja. haben auch ausgewechselt. Da das hält heißt, der Konsul noch, bravourös. Es hat sich jeder ausgeredet, dass wir zu viel trainiert haben vor dem Spiel. Ich glaube es gar nicht. Ich glaube eher, dass jeder 100% konzentriert war von den Spielern und jeder wollte zeigen, die körperliche Verfassung, die er hat. Und zweite hat sich das Berg abgegangen. Wir waren von den Seiten her ziemlich offen. Kiprich hier. Die Ungarn bekannt ja für ihre guten Flanken. Auch hier kommt die Flanke genau auf Detari und das 1 zu 1 in der 65. Minute. Konsul hier machtlos. Dietmar? Naja, es war... Ein Durcheinander im Strafraum und man hat gesehen, es waren drei Spieler von uns, aber der Täter ist allein zum Köpfen gekommen und das ist natürlich eine schlechte Sache, wenn das passiert. Der Ernst Happel scheint da schon zu ahnen, was auf ihn zukommt. Wieder ein Fehlpass von Andreas Ogris. Der Wechsel Vinci gegen Esseni hat sich auch positiv bemerkbar gemacht und Täter ist kaum in den Griff zu bekommen. Da haben wir Glück gehabt. Jena jetzt, er spürt, dass seine Mannschaft gewinnen kann. Ja, der Trainer hat schon gewusst, er hat oft einmal während dem Spiel gesagt, jetzt bekommen wir das nächste Tor. Er hat einiges schon vorausgesagt immer. Da haben wir zu der Zeit, wie wir angefangen haben, haben wir immer 20, 30 Minuten einen Hänger gehabt und das hat er immer bemängelt und das war in Ungarn eigentlich die ganze zweite Halbzeit so. So fällt also in der 70. Minute das 2 zu 1, das Siegestor durch Kovac für die Ungarn. Aber die Österreicher haben doch in Ansätzen gezeigt, wie man Fußball spielen könnte mit den österreichischen Bedingungen und Möglichkeiten, aber wir verlieren 1 zu 2. In white were the first to score. A foul there by Nielsen on Gokart gives the Turks this free kick. 
And what a great goal it was. 34th minute, Hami scoring for Turkey to put them 1-0 ahead. That's the way it stood at half-time. There's an ironic aspect to this match. Look at that free kick. And that is that the coach of the Turkish team, Sepp Piontek of Germany, was a very successful coach of Denmark. Uh, took them to two European Championships and a World Cup before taking over for, as the coach of Turkey. Well, Elstrup scoring for the uh, Danes in the 75th minute there, equalising. Only came on in the 74th minute. But the Turks won it. Hakan with two minutes to go, putting them 2-1 up. Jan Molby tries to stop at the ball on the line, but fails. Now look at this, definitely that ball over the line. So Turkey beating Denmark 2-1. And from that match in Ankara, we go to Bucharest, the first match in 53 years between Romania and Latvia. 10,000 crowd in the uh, Bucharest Stadium. Romania very much on top here, and a fabulous goal there by Badia after just five minutes. The pass from Petrescu puts Romania 1-0 ahead. Second half action now, 54 minutes, and Petrescu himself, PSV Eindhoven player, gets onto the scorecard. Good through pass there, appalling marking by the defence. And Petrescu puts the hosts 2-0 ahead. Should have been considerably more than that. The Romanians really dominated this match over Latvia. Handball there by one of the Latvians. Gives the Romanians a penalty, but look at this. Balint misses it. Good save there by the goalie, but Romania beat Latvia 2-0 in Bucharest. Well now to international friendly action from last night and Austria in the white with the black shorts against Lithuania and this was a comfortable success for Austria who got back to winning ways in international football. Polsters run down the right, a nice cross and a lovely header from Andreas Ogres, the 27-year-old from Austria, Vienna, opens the scoring. A really great header this and the Lithuanian goalkeeper simply had no chance with that. 32 minutes gone, and goal number two coming up. Christian Prozanek, the 23-year-old who also plays for Austria Vienna, getting it. And Lithuania really completely outclassed. Narbekos brought out the best of Wolfart just before half-time and Lithuania showed that they could surprise a few people but Tony Polster the leading scorer for Austria at the moment grabbed another goal after 36 minutes and Austria had a comfortable 3-0 lead at half-time into the second half now Polster had been substituted and Ralf Hassenholt had come on he'd only been on the field two minutes and the 24-year-old kept his cool and scored Austria's fourth. A great moment for the substitute and a comfortable for success for Austria. Welcome back to Eurosport News. And in Prague this afternoon, world champions Germany continue their build-up towards the European Championships in Sweden in June with a friendly international against Czechoslovakia. The Czechs had uh, drawn their last game in Prague, 2-2 against England, uh, having led twice in the match, and Germany, uh, who were without uh, Lothar Matthäus for this game, and will indeed be without uh, the uh, big influential captain uh, for the whole of the rest of the summer, including the European Championships, were anxious to get a winning result this afternoon. Well, all the action really came in the first half with Germany having all the best chances. Uh, Rudy Voller and Klinsmann in particular uh, were getting the best of them. Germany, though, were to take the lead after Stefan Edenberger uh, put a lovely through ball through to Voller, who was brought down, and they were awarded this free kick. Thomas Hassler took it, and... The Czech goalkeeper, Queen's Park Rangers Jan Steschkal, given no chance as Germany take the lead after 40 minutes. Hassler's shot into the top right-hand corner and a great goal for the Germans. But their lead was to only last five minutes as Czechoslovakia 
a bounce straight back. Skaravi claims the penalty. The challenge was by Kula. The penalty is given. And Michael Bilek is left with the opportunity to equalise for Czechoslovakia. The Genoa striker made a meal of it. There was contact from Kula. But perhaps they were lucky. The 26-year-old Michael Bilek winning his 31st cap. Plays, of course, for Seville in Spain. Scored his 11th goal for Czechoslovakia. And the final score in Prague. Czechoslovakia won. Germany won. All the action in the first 45 minutes. The World Cup Finals in the United States of America may not be till 1994, but Belgium got off to a winning start in Group 4 for the qualifying places for European teams, although they'll be disappointed with their narrow victory against Cyprus, just the one goal coming from Mark Vilmoff from Standard Lie. Spain and Albania also in action in their opening match in Group 3. Welcome back to Eurosport News and we bring you action from World Cup 1994 qualifications and firstly the game between Belgium and Cyprus played last night. Group 4 of course is quite keenly contested with Romania, Czechoslovakia and Wales along with Belgium battling for two places and the only goal of the game came when Mark Vilmot, the 23 year old striker from Standard Liège, headed home Johan Valmans cross after 24 minutes. A well flighted cross for Vilmot to get his head to it. Michalis Christofi will be disappointed in the Cyprus goal. Belgium could and perhaps should have scored more. Vilmot having the best chance just after the break. But Belgium win, but the scoreline will be very disappointing for them. Plenty of Irish interest in our next action, which is of Spain and Albania. Both North and Southern Ireland are in this group. And when Michel, the 29-year-old Real Madrid striker, got his 20th goal for Spain after just two minutes, it looked like we might have an avalanche of goals. Well, anything but, and it had to be into the second half before Spain really stepped up the pressure. Several chances, the best of them falling to Emilio Butragueño, who heads just wide. But that was just before Spain were to get a penalty. A foul was on Baquero by the Albanian goalkeeper. And Michel was given the opportunity and gratefully accepted his 21st goal for his country in his 63rd international appearance. Three minutes from time now before the third and final goal of the game. The 24-year-old Fernando Hierro, Michel's and Butragueño's teammates for Real Madrid in his 11th appearance from Spain gets their third goal in front of what was a disappointing crowd of just over 10,000. Spain 3, Albania 0 in this opening match in the World Cup qualifying Group 3. Well, Sweden are going to be the centre of national football attention and internationally, of course, as well, when they play host to the eight-nation European Championships, which get underway in June. Well, in their build-up to the European Championships, Sweden uh, took in a match against Tunisia. Tunisia, of course, uh, who are looking to qualify for the World Cups themselves, and they're starting their build-up uh, with this friendly international against the Swedes. Fouazi had the best chance... Uh, for Tunisia, shooting just wide. But the only goal of the game was a strange one. 63 minutes gone, and Kent Anderson gets the chance and slips the ball past a bemused Tunisian goalkeeper to send the Swedish fans in the crowd delirious. It wasn't all Sweden, however, and they were nearly shocked twice in the closing stages. Bentar had the first chance, and it was only the crossbar that was to save the Swedes in the dying minutes. Limam gets the chance and hits the bar. Sweden win in Tunisia 
by one goal to nil. England's build-up for the European Championships continued along the right path in Moscow. Still unbeaten away from home under Graham Taylor, Gary Lineker with the opener on the end of Tony Daly's cross. The crowd was just 15,000, but the CIS were in no mood to compromise. Just before half-time, Saraze took advantage of some sloppy defending. Chris Woods had a reasonable game, although he had a little chance in the scramble for the ball after Sviba hit the post. Sergei Kiryakov, the eventual scorer. England now trailing 2-1, needed a little inspiration. It came via Nigel Clough. His beautifully weighted pass helping Trevor Stephen to his first goal for England for six years. Both managers said to be delighted with the result. Let's see how they fare in Sweden in June. 53.000 Zuschauer im ausverkauften Praterstadion sehen dann beim fünften Totoländerspiel gegen Wales, wie Österreichs Teamspieler versuchen, die Forderungen von Ernst Happel zu erfüllen. Faul hier an Andreas Ogris und da ist der Weltmeister selbst manchmal an der Outlinie. Freistoß, abgewehrt von Southall im Nachschuss und auf der Linie gerettet. Dietmar, großer Druck hier und große Begeisterung in unserer Mannschaft. Ja, es ist natürlich wahnsinnig wichtig, dass so viele Leute gekommen sind. Es war ein sehr gutes Spiel, natürlich gegen eine britische Mannschaft ist immer schwer. Es war aber nicht unfair, es war ein sehr hartes Spiel. Wir haben aber eigentlich über 90 Minuten einen sehr guten Angriffsfußball gespielt. Und leider hat sie das halt nicht in einen Sieg ummünzen lassen. Southall im Tor von Wales auch sehr gut, die Abwehr relativ gut postiert. Aber der Druck der Österreicher hält in dieser ersten Spielhälfte an. Polster. War ein super Schuss von Flögel. Ja, das ist eine Spezialität aus der Luft, die Bälle übernehmen. Seine Körperhaltung ist immer perfekt und das macht er sehr gut. Mit ein bisschen Glück hätte es ohne weiteres das 1 zu 0 sein können. Wieder gehalten. Da ärgert man sich natürlich schon auch auf der Betreuerbahn. Es war wieder Flögel. Ja, das ist Gott sei Dank schon andere gegen uns so gegangen, dass die Chancen nicht verwertet haben. Ein Zigarettel für den Weltmeister. Ja, das Zigarettel hat er immer gern geraucht. Aber wie gesagt, da sieht man jetzt das 1 zu 0 durch Bauer Michi. Der war leicht abgefälscht, der Ball, aber das war eigentlich die verdiente Führung zu der Zeit. Das war in der 58. Minute. Man muss auch sagen, dass Andreas Ogris einen Jochbeinbruch in diesem Spiel erlitten hat. So hart ist es manchmal zugegangen. Ja, bei den Luftkämpfen stecken die Waliser natürlich nicht zurück und wir haben leider zum Schluss nicht das Glück gehabt, dass wir dieses Spiel dann gewinnen. Da haben wir noch Glück gehabt. Der Kopfball geht hier daneben. Es war ein Kopfball von Roberts. Wir sehen das auch gleich in der Zeitlupe. Da sah man auch, dass die österreichischen Verteidiger lernen mussten, mit solchen Flanken und mit hohen Bällen umzugehen. Alles scheint so zu sein, dass Österreich einem verdienten Sieg entgegensteuert. Dann ein Abwehrfehler und das 1 zu 1 durch Coleman und das erst in der 83. Minute. Ja, so ist im Fußball. Wir haben einige Chancen nicht verwertet, haben den Ausgleich knapp Verstoß bekommen und leider nur einen Punkt gemacht vor so einer schönen Kulisse. Konzentrationsfehler, also auch Dinge, die Happel im Verlauf dieser Saison ausmerzen will. Aber wir haben in diesem Spiel noch eine Chance durch Hasenhüttel, aber wieder Southall. Und so bleibt es beim 1 zu 1. Auch hier die Statistik. Gets 
well above a fair share of goals. Well, he started it off by a good interception. He made a strong run and maybe should have had a shot, but he let it off. And uh, the young boy Hughes got a lovely ball across, and there it is, 2-0. That's an interesting ball by Barna Baranowskis. Pick up, the cry at the back. There might be something here. How magnificently finished. And out of nothing, Lithuania gets something to lift their whole World Cup campaign. Beautifully done. We'll see it again here. Well, it's a lovely turn inside, but I'll be very disappointed because uh, we were left very poor in the back. Five-man wall. Let us just make sure all his angles are right and he knows where every part of the woodwork is. Well struck, magnificent equaliser! Friedrichas, Robertus Friedrichas. The Lithuanians have all gone to him. And no wonder, look at this. I think that the goalkeeper will be very disappointed with that. It was the one corner that he was supposed to be looking after. Donald got the first touch. It was Dowie. Tremendous volley. Tremendous but it doesn't volley. seem to be Northern Ireland's night at the moment, anyway. Well, it is brilliant, <laughs> but the way you looked on Thursday, I gather that it certainly was oh, brilliant. Oh, yeah, the had terrific. I'd but this, this you game, with it. You were like Robocop. Yeah, it was nil-nil at half-time, but the second half, uh, you know, the Irish, I think, had a little word at half-time from Jack Morris. Yeah. It came out. Townsend with the, the shot there, and yeah. that opened the floodgates a bit because up to that point the USA had played quite well, you know. I know it's amazing. But really, then Dennis Irwin bending in a free kick. Yeah. Oh, Tony Miola, the goalkeeper, who's the number one American goalkeeper. They were minus, I think, about three or four players that they might bring in Jim for their uh, for, the, for US, the finals. Yeah. The this is Noel squad. Quinn scoring now. Big Nile at the back Nile post there. Up the back, get it in off the post. The thing about the Americans, you know, they played nice football, but. They're playing it all in their own half. Yeah. You know, they haven't as yet uh, found out that you've got to go in the other team's half. No, and, uh, well, this, this is was a good goal. Tony Cascarino came on. Casa scoring. It's a big nail towards the end. But then yeah. the, the Americans did score right at the end here, Jim, and it was not a bad goal. Wijnaldo, who played in the, the last World Cup team, took this well. Yeah. They've got a game in Albania, haven't they? Yeah, uh, no, no, Rangers play in the, the I... uh, Republic. Play Soccer's famous yellow and blue strip arrives in Montevideo as Brazil visit Uruguay for a friendly international. Early pressure by Brazil goes unrewarded on a cold evening. Uruguay too have their chances. Both teams are weakened by the absence of many of their European-based stars. But Adrian Paz eventually breaks the deadlock, and Uruguay hold on to defeat Brazil for the first time in seven years. FIFA uphold Puerto Rico's win over the Dominican Republic in the very first preliminary World Cup qualifier. The Dominicans had complained that Puerto Rico had fielded nine mainland Americans. Puerto Rico now faced Jamaica in the next round. In Ushgorod, the Ukraine's joy at playing their first international since 1936 is soon dampened when Salai scores for their visitors Hungary in red. The Ukraine are missing some key players who are still representing the CIS. With a weakened team, it's not surprising when they concede a second goal scored by Kiprić. Kiprich then scores a third to ensure victory for Hungary. But there's some consolation for the Ukrainians as Gekka makes it 3-1. And now on a lighter note, a friendly match played in Stockholm last night between Sweden and Poland. Sweden, of course, will be hosting those European Soccer Championships this year. And in the ninth minute from a free kick, Kenneth Andersen scoring a great long-range goal there in front of 9,500 spectators. Those European Championships in early June. Of course, Sweden have got automatic entry to them and at the moment looking for good competition while other teams have been busy qualifying. Well, Anderson is scoring his second there in the 25th minute, putting them 2-0 up. 
Graham Taylor, of course, the England manager, after England uh, were awarded their European Championships from 1976, certainly indicated his one reservation was that as hosts, England qualify automatically and so may have trouble finding opposition in their build-up, with other countries busy playing actual qualification games. Well, Sweden had trouble finding decent opposition last night. A 43rd minute goal there by Klaus Ingerson, putting them 3-0 up. Now in the 62nd minute, Martin Darlin gets their fourth. The Polish defence really been carved open there. They were 3-0 down at half-time. Second half wasn't much better for them. Just five minutes after that Darlin goal, Stefan Pedersen scored the fifth Swedish goal. Sweden, of course, in Group A of the European Championships this summer against France, Yugoslavia and England. Group B is Russia, Holland, Scotland. England continued their European Championship build-up last night with a hard-fought 1-0 victory over Hungary in the Nepp Stadium. It was a mixed uh, English performance. Uh, Graham Taylor deciding to bring on several substitutes, notably in the second half. The best chance just before half-time fell to Gary Lineker, who's still one goal behind Bobby Charlton's international all-time record. Hungary, though, had chances of their own, and England used both David Seaman and Nigel Martin in this match. The only goal of the game came after 57 minutes. Lineker so often a scorer, this time the provider. Webb's header down, turned into his own net by Andres Telek, the 21-year-old winning his third cap. Lineker's cross was a beauty. Webb's downward header turned in off the defender. Hungry nil. The World Cup finals in the United States may be two years off, but qualification is now getting going in Europe. And this game between Greece and Iceland produced just one goal. Greece in the white. In group five, which looks a pretty hot group, with the CIS, Yugoslavia and Hungary battling for the two places. The only goal of the game coming after 28 minutes. Sofia Pulas getting it and Greece winning by one goal to nil. Iceland had one or two chances later in the match. But it was Greece who ended up the winners by one goal to nil. The two sides meet again on October the 7th. The Faroe Islands in white have a rude World Cup awakening when Balint opens the scoring for Romania in a qualifying match. Haji adds another before Lakatouche converts a penalty. Balint then scores his second. 4-0 Romania. And Lupescu makes it 5-0 by half-time. In the second half, Pana scores Romania's sixth. And then Balint completes his hat-trick and a miserable night for the part-timers from the Faroes. Australia or Holland will take the last place in the Olympic soccer tournament will be resolved on Sunday after a one-all draw in Sydney. Holland bronze medalist on three occasions went behind after 25 minutes from fullback Tony Vidmar. The Australian showing a cool head as he outwitted Dutch defender Mark Overmars and shooting between the legs of Mitchell van der Haag. But Holland were not about to give away the chance of reaching Barcelona. Knowing the Australians would have to travel to Utrecht for the final game in the qualifying group, the Dutch pressed hard for an equaliser, which came from Sean Murphy's mistake three minutes after the interval. Dean Gore from the Dortrecht club proved an inspiration for the Dutch in midfield, although the goal actually came as Murphy headed a corner into his own net. Socceroos coach Eddie Thompson conceded the odds were in favour of Holland, who can call upon the younger players from Ajax, Feyenoord and PSV Eindhoven for Sunday's game. Romania. That's a great long ball. And G! Oh, it's a goal! What a start by Romania. Four minutes gone, and Wales are a goal down. And it's number 10, the captain, Georgi Haji, who came sprinting through the middle. Ten is Haji. And Lakatouche is with him. 
maybe Hadji who hits this one. Oh, it's over the top again. Is this number two? It is. It's a disastrous start for Wales. Lupescu has made it 2-0. Six minutes gone. He stood behind the wall and then broke away unmarked. Got round them all. Hadji popping up all over the place. Bella did each. Crossing it in on the act as well. Lupescu. 3-0. And they just teed it up. There were so many options on for them here. Lack of two. She lets the two players come to him. Just teed it up beautifully. against Wales, look at that ball, hit from their own half, beautifully controlled by Ballard, he took all the pace off it, it sat up nicely for him. Sabau, forward, Petrescu, great ball across the six-yard box, and Melville put it behind for the corner, and they look likely to score Romania almost every time they come forward, and that's their first corner, Sabau, Balin is in the middle. Lakatus went away. This is Hadji. Oh, it's in! It's five! Southall beaten from 30 yards, surely. And Hadji, the captain, makes it five. And Wales just do not know what's going on. Their World Cup qualifying dreams are turning to ashes in the very first match. Southall got his hands on it, he couldn't keep it out, he pushed it upwards, it went under the crossbar. Dean Saunders. Good run through the middle here. Rush. Wales have scored. Four minutes gone in the second half. And the Liverpool striker begins to put a little bit of respectability to the scoreline. It's the first time that Wales have seriously threatened Romania's goal, chipped up by his... Liverpool teammate Dean Saunders, rush beat offside, just took it away from Stelia, the keeper, and then side foot into the empty net. Lupescu, scorer of two of the goals, gives it to Sabau, Haji, Sabau again. Now they can threaten here. Balint, great chance, fine save, Southall. But again, the football looks so easy by Romania. And Lakatouche now, and Wales were caught, pushing forward, looking for an extra goal. Balance there. Lakatouche has gone round the defender, and he gave it to Neville Southall when it looked easier to score. But as Wales pushed forward, looking for a second goal, they were caught desperately short at the back. Barry Horn. This is now stoppage time. Still Wales looking for a second goal. David Phillips. Mark Hughes has beaten offside. Here's Hughes. Oh, it hit the heels of the defender. And Wales have missed another opportunity. It would have been academic, but it would have been a lot of satisfaction because they've done much better in the second half, having conceded five goals in the first half. They've kept the score sheet down in the second and have scored one of their own, and it might have been two. A thumping for Wales, I'm afraid, in the World Cup qualifier. 5-1 against Romania, and that's how that table looks at the moment. Romania won their first two games in that qualification. Well, es folgt das Länderspiel gegen Polen in Salzburg, und in Salzburg haben die Österreicher eine sehr gute Bilanz zu verteidigen. Die erste große Möglichkeit durch Peter Stöger, aber die Polen kontern überaus geschickt. Und Kosetzki gelingt das 1 zu 0 für die Gäste. Es ist sehr schnell gegangen. 
In diesem Spiel, das haben sich vielleicht viele erwartet, dass es in Salzburg so weitergeht wie bisher in Salzburg, dass wir gewinnen. Aber die Polen waren der erwartete schwere Kontergegner. Wir haben gewusst, die sind hinten sehr stabil. Da spielt, glaube ich, noch der Lesiak. Da sieht man ihn im Bild, der was jetzt bei Innsbruck spielt. Und im Konter sind sie immens gefährlich gewesen und das haben sie dann leider auch bewiesen. Den Österreichern gelingt durch Ralf Hasenhüttl nach diesem Eckball allerdings das 1 zu 1. Das war ein schwerer Dormannfehler, den muss er, glaube ich, halten. Aber Gott sei Dank haben wir den Ausgleich noch gemacht. Wir sehen es noch einmal. Eckball Stöger, Kopfball Hasenhüttl aufgesetzt und der Ausgleich. Zu dieser Zeit haben wir noch gehofft. Da hat es noch ganz gut ausgeschaut, aber im Laufe des Spiels sind wir immer weniger ins Spiel gekommen und haben dann eigentlich wieder einige Fehler gemacht und da sieht man schon das 1 zu 2 und dann ist eigentlich nicht mehr viel zusammengelaufen. Das war ein entscheidender Fehler, die Abwehr auch diesmal wieder bei diesem Konter völlig offen. Wir sehen dieses Tor hier gleich noch einmal, der Torschütze wieder Kosetzky, der Legionär bei Galatasaray. Das war eigentlich eines der, Sp der Spiele, die der Trainer überhaupt nicht wollen hat. Es war ein großer Rückschritt für ihn, er hat es zwar nicht so öffentlich zugegeben, aber er war eigentlich nach diesem Spiel schwer enttäuscht, über die Höhe und über die Umstände im Umfeld auch, wie er zu dieser Niederlage gekommen ist. Das ist schon das 1 zu 3 durch Warzicha. Auch diesen Treffer sehen wir gleich noch einmal. Schiebt den Ball an Wohlfahrt vorbei. 3 zu 1 und schließlich folgt noch das 4 zu 1 für die Gäste aus Polen durch Kowalczyk. Ja, auch wieder ein Aufsitzer. Da schaut der Tormann immer unglücklich aus, aber ich glaube, da kann er nicht viel machen. Es ist halt so, bei 1 zu 3, 1 zu 4 ist die ganze Mannschaft verunsichert und so war es auch dann. Für den Debütanten Waldhör von äh, Vorwärts Steier gibt es dann noch ein kleines Erfolgserlebnis. Er verkürzt auf 2 zu 4. Aber es war dennoch eine enttäuschende Leistung der österreichischen Mannschaft. Ja, es war auch eine riesen Enttäuschung für den Trainer selber. Er war nach dem Spiel äh, ziemlich geschockt, weil er die gute Aufbauarbeit, die er geleistet hat, unterbrochen gesehen hat. Da sieht man es an seinen Gästen, wie er sich aufregt bei diesem Spiel. Er hat das einfach nicht begreifen können. Und da sieht man noch einmal die Torschützen. Leider 2 zu 4 verloren. An action now from Salzburg. This is an international between Austria and Poland. Poland in the red shirts, going into the lead after 10 minutes through Kozeki. Austria have had disappointing results in recent years and also been embarrassed by the likes of the Faroe Islands. They equalized after 20 minutes through Hassan Hutel. crowd of 12,000 watching this international. Something for them to enjoy. But not for long. After 32 minutes, Poland were back in the lead. And watch out once again for Kozeki, who is going to score his second goal of the match. Poland back in the lead by two goals to one. That's the way it stayed at half-time. Difficult times for the Austrian coach. He thought he had problems before. You wait to see what happened in the 58th minute. Ball coming through for Varshika to make it 3-1. Poland now in control and enjoying their afternoon's work. Five minutes further on into the game and it became 4-1. Kowalczyk. Spectacular kick, really, from the rebound. Goalkeeper will be quite disappointed, though, that he failed to get to it. Ball bouncing over his head, and Poland now in a 4-1 lead. See the replay, how the ball really spurted up for the goalkeeper. And I don't think the fans would have been too appeased, even by the 68th-minute goal for Waldhauer. 
The final score, Austria 2, Poland 4. And another difficult defeat for Austria to have to endure. Well, this is Ancelotti saying farewell to AC Milan, who he retires from. And this happened last night in the game between AC Milan and Brazil. Milan including their Dutch trio of Van Basten, Rijkaard and of course Hullet. Brazil having drawn one all with England at Wembley on Sunday, game in which Bobito scored for them. But uh, unfortunately not a terribly interesting game, just one goal in it. And it came from one of the oldest men on the field. The young stars from Brazil not really shining, but Careca can still do the business for them. Coming on at half-time as a substitute and heading the only goal of the match after 57 minutes. Not the sort of game many people want to see again. Final score, AC Milan nil. The three-time world champions, Brazil won. Back. This is the World Cup Group 4 qualifying match in Bucharest between Romania and Wales. Romania going into an early lead after four minutes through George Hadji. Long ball by Lakatouche, headed on by Belint, and Hadji supplying the finish. Wales had entered the game in high spirits. They believed they could do very well in the European Championships that earned victories against Germany and also Belgium, although they failed to qualify for the actual finals itself. But they really were up against it. Six minutes had gone. Azerwood had given away a free kick. And Haji about to flick the ball over the wall. And Lupescu with the finish to make it 2-0. This after just six minutes. Welsh defence in real disarray. There's a strong Welsh team. Neville Southall in goal. And the attack of Ian Rush and Mark Hughes. But 2-0 down after six minutes didn't give them an awful lot of hope, really, for the rest of the game. Lovely chip over by Haji. Real Madrid player had one of his best evenings for Romania for some time. Romania, a few weeks ago, had beaten Faroe Islands by seven goals to nil. And looked like they were going to score something similar in this game. Lupescu's second goal of the evening after 23 minutes. Romania now three, Wales nil. Once again, the Welsh defence torn to shreds. No one was watching Lupescu and Southall unable to get to the ball. 3-0 and more to follow. Long pass by Pepescu and Berlint makes it 4-0 after 31 minutes. Pinpoint accuracy there by Pepescu. And Berlint again given the time to direct the ball into the net. Three minutes later, 34 minutes of the game gone. And watch for a spectacular shot. And once again, it's going to be Georges Haji having one of those games. Southall unable to stop the ball going in. And after just 34 minutes of the game, Wales were 5-0 down. Really, there shouldn't have been any real problems with that particular shot. But Southall couldn't collect it, and 5-0 the score. Case now of trying to limit the damage. And Ian Rush scored his first goal in the World Cup qualifying tournament for seven years. For once, the 30,000 crowd silent. A stunning performance there for Romania. Winners by five goals to one. Despair for Wales. Welcome back to Eurosport News and with several countries' eyes, of course, on the European Championships, one mustn't forget that the European qualification for the 1994 World Cup is well underway. Republic of Ireland, uh, managed by Jack Charlton, of course, win action last night against Albania and could and perhaps should have taken the lead early with this fine flying header uh, by Manchester City's Niall Quinn. Ireland, of course, who uh, qualified and did so well in the last uh, World Cup when they lost in the quarterfinals uh, to Italy, uh, the host nation, had several chances at Lansdowne Road, 
and uh, perhaps uh, Ray Houghton uh, had the best of them. But they had to wait until the second half before they could finally uh, break down a very stubborn Albanian defence. Roy Keane with the cross and Tranmere Rovers, John Aldrich with the header. 1-0 uh, to the Irish uh, on the hour and it was richly deserved. Keane who thought very highly in English football uh, flooded in a marvellous cross and the uh, goal eventually scored uh, by Aldridge, rich reward. Ireland uh, continued to bombard the Albanian defence and Danny was simply uh, magnificent uh, in goal and he stopped an avalanche for the team that lost 3-0 in their opening match against Spain. Paul McGrath thought he'd got a second, the claims for offside justified. Uh, McGrath did himself no favours and it was eventually uh, booked uh, for the insult. But McGrath got his reward, Mick McCarthy's long throw. The Aston Villa centre-half McGrath, so successful on these set pieces, came in with the header and the Irish two up. A real tremendous throw that's uh, really used to affect uh, by McCarthy. As we see it again, splitting the Albanian defence, really getting them at square, and McCarthy coming in to score a fine goal. 2-0 to Ireland. Staying on football and the uh, big results uh, this evening. Uh, Holland beating Austria 3-2. Uh, Rijkaard and Burkamp among their scorers. They were 2-0 up there. And Sweden uh, defeating Hungary uh, by two goals to one. The big night of international friendlies. We'll have the goals from those matches in Eurosport News tomorrow evening. It was a busy night of friendly football internationals as teams got their final preparations for the European Championships, which start in under a month's time. Here, host nation Sweden were in winning action in their match against Hungary. Arsenal's Anders Limpar uh, hit the bar with Hungarian goalkeeper Roxar, no chance. Sweden were pretty impressive and they'll have to show this type of performance in the games against France, Yugoslavia and England next month. They took the lead after 32 minutes. Steven Swartz knocking the ball past uh, Brockhazer in fine style to give Sweden the lead. Swartz was to get a second uh, for the Swedes four minutes before half time. A slight suspicion of offside. But when the ball eventually comes to him, he finishes it well and gives Sweden a two-goal advantage. Hungary, who lost to England at 1-0 in the next stadium. Budapest last month found themselves two goals down here in Stockholm in front of a disappointing crowd of only 8,000. Surely there'll be more for Sweden's opening game against France in the European Championships. Into the second half now, and the Swedes looking uh, to build further but Brockhaver denying Anders Limpar. 64 minutes gone now, and Hungary hit Sweden on the counter. Ball dropping nicely to Martin, who drives past Ravelli and scores for Hungary. But the final score in this friendly, Sweden 2, Hungary 1. France's preparations for the European Championships, where they're in the same group as England, Sweden and Yugoslavia, looked to be going well in this match uh, last night in Lausanne, when they took the lead after just 20 minutes. A nice build-up and a typically slick finish. With the header coming in from Fabrice Diver after 20 minutes. Gave Michel Platini's side a well-deserved lead. But Switzerland are dangerous opponents in the same World Cup group as Scotland, Italy and Portugal. They'll have a big say in what happens in who goes to the finals in the United States. A great header, though, from Diva, a late replacement into the French squad. As we see it for a third time, a flying header. 1-0 to the French. In front, though, for only eight minutes. Now Switzerland hit well on the counter. A fine finish from Christopher Bonvin. And the Lausanne crowd really appreciated that. 
Martini well beaten and Switzerland on level terms. Again, a slight suspicion of offside, but he took it coolly and Switzerland on level terms. Michel Platini will have been very disappointed with the way that his defence was caught so square. Into the second half now, and 18 minutes from the end, it's Bonvin again, and Switzerland in the lead. And this result will go round Europe to the managers of the other seven nations in the European Championships. The French having lost for only the second time in the last two years, the other being against England at Wembley. And certainly Martini will be disappointed with that. Other results uh, last night, and let's start with the international being played at Sitar, where Holland beat Austria by three goals to two. What must have delighted Hans Mikkel in the Dutch management was the goal that Ruud Hullet scored five minutes from time on his first international appearance back after injury. The other Dutch goals coming from Rijkaard and Burkamp. And in the Belgium Cup, the semi-finals are both all square with the second legs at the weekend. There's still considerable doubt about the participation of Yugoslavia in next month's European Championships. Denmark are on standby if the Yugoslavs are unable to compete during, due to the civil war in their country. Well, their warm-up hardly got off to an ideal start in their match against Fiorentina, despite the fact that they were in front very early in the game. Fiorentina clearly didn't attract uh, the supporters for this game. A sparse crowd saw Yugoslavia in front from Jankovic. Fiorentina from the Italian Serie A hit back after 68 minutes and Maialeno getting the first of two. De Paglegra, six minutes from time, wrapping things up. Disappointment for Yugoslavia and on Friday they'll know whether they will be playing in the European Championships in Sweden. The sports world was attempting to come to terms with the United Nations sanctions against Serbia and Montenegro on Saturday, a ban which, which has forced Yugoslavia out of the European Soccer Championships, That's th despite the arrival of the team already. Players from the two leading Belgrade clubs, Red Star and Partizan, would have made up the bulk of the squad, plus those who have been enticed away from Yugoslavia by foreign clubs. But it's not to be. Yugoslavia are out. Denmark are in. The Yugoslav football team have indeed now left Sweden. The team had intended to stay at the site of the European Championships as a protest against the United Nations directive, which banned them from international sporting competition. They've now decided, though, to go home. Here's Valdo. For Bebeto. And uh, it's not held by Chris Woods. He did well to get to the shot. Lineker. He's passed. Cars in. Penalty. Lineker's earned it. And Lineker will surely take it. At the end, where he missed the penalty in the FA Cup final last season. Oh, and he's missed this one! Oh, dear! And here's Rai. For Luis Enrique. He's got Renato to the right, Bebeto to the left. And Luis Enrique tries to get beyond Walker. Renato. Paul Stevens has missed it, Bebeto has scored! mistake by Gary Stevens, a goal for Bebeto, England nil, Brazil one. Here's Platt, Brazil have got back, thirty through by Stevens, Lineker, Stevens again, it's very well hit. 
Well, Gary Stevens, who hasn't scored for England and would feel after the nature of Brazil's goal here that it would have been very timely to have broken his duck. Now Walker. Well, Lineker's challenge was enough to get the ball back to Webb. Charlotte with the header. Oh, and it's gone straight to David Platt, who's put it in the back of the net. 1-1. Welcome back. Billy Bingham's Northern Ireland side may not have a place in next week's European finals, but Germany certainly have. And if this were a tournament game, the Ulsterman would have been very happy indeed. Northern Ireland were, in effect, facing a side that will contest the championship. And Michael Hughes of Manchester City showed his side meant business after 22 minutes. A cracker. A naturally muted response from the crowd at Bremen. It was only as half-time was approaching that the fans started getting edgy. And just before the break, Manfred Binns got the equaliser, albeit on the back of something of a scramble. This was only a friendly. The boys in green have a lot to be proud of. Germany are, of course, without Luther Matthäus as they will be for the championship finals. He's had a bad knee injury, so the Germans are desperately trying to build around Stefan Effenberg. Doesn't seem to be working. Despite Germany's efforts to pacify a distinguished crowd, one all it ended. And it up for somebody. It was Scully Varnoff who almost got the benefit. Oh, that's a terrible back pass. This is Christiansen, and the keeper's out of his area, and Denmark have taken the lead. He never really looked, did he? Stadzer, the player from Moscow Sparta, it was always in his mind that he was going to give that back to the keeper, and he was never going to get there first. Cherchesov. Dispossessed by the tattle of Christofti. This is Sieverbeck. Well, it's beginning to open out into a good, entertaining match. Christiansen! Oh, he put it into the side netting. But a great chance for his second and Denmark's second. It was a fine break by the number 15. It's Denmark who come away with it in the form of Poulsen. Pursued by Shalimov. Still Poulsen. Outside to Villefort. Oh, oh, he's hit the post. Christiansen, who's already scored one, might have had a second. He might have had a hat trick. It was a terrific break by Denmark. And again, it was the pace of the little number 15. This is Ivanov. Came on as a substitute. Shalimov. Now, oh, is here a chance? Surely now, yes, that's it, the equaliser. 1-1. Oh. Kolivanov, one of the two who plays his football in Italy, equalising for the CIS with ten minutes gone in this second half. And really there were players queuing up them, and that's the first decent chance that they've made. Build that was neat, the opportunity might end up. Hit the bar, Mikhailachenko. And still it hasn't been cleared. And it looks at one stage in that build up as though the CIS were a little bit too uh, precise. It's not quite enough urgency. But the ball finally broke to Mikhailachenko, whose left foot shot rattled the woodwork. The teams, Norway, were without their three English-based players from Arsenal, Paul Ledison, Oldham's Gunnar Haller, with the injured Tottenham keeper Eric Torsved, the best known of those three missing. As for Scotland, Andy Gorham had overcome his recent knee problems and was back in goal. Maurice Malpass was entering Scotland's Hall of Fame by winning his 50th cap. And Brian McClare was looking for his first international goal 
on his 23rd appearance. Our commentator in Oslo, Barry Davis. Boyd, seizing every chance to get forward. This is McClare, and the goalkeeper had to recover his position. Great moving feet then by Grogos. Good try by McClare. Dahlem. Bohinen. Pedersen. Gets a nice return. Rechtal, who played him in, didn't really strike it that cleanly. And the angle was against him. And the angle, anyway, slightly narrowed by Gorham. Person. Good to see him getting forward. He's made a super run down the middle and wasn't given the ball. So I've seen Richard Goff have better start to a match than this one. And now he's offside, McPherson. With a bit of frustration there for Andy Roxborough because his spare defender at the back made an excellent run through. Wasn't picked up, but wasn't seen by Richard Goff. And now he is friendly. Just a touch in by McLaren, and Gorham enjoys a little bit of fortune. But he's able to grab the ball with a good clean break. It was lost for a second and reclaimed. Mistake by McLaren, who to his credit recovered extremely well. 21 year old from Hearts. Too long. Third corner comes to nothing for the Norwegians in the last minute of the first half. McStay, and it comes to Mickland. He wasn't too far away. Set himself. But wide of the angle. That's better. McStay. McClare to the right. McCoy's to the left. Still a chance for the cross. And the curler. it might be argued that McClare has come nearest for Scotland. First has come up in the centre of the six-yard area. That's he. McAllister timed it the better. McPherson. Dury! Good header. But comfortably taken by the goalkeeper. Many would have been spectacular with that, but the goalkeeper just moved across and took the catch. Berdiger. Just brushed the head. And Strandley. Bernabeu. Gorham decides not to come for it, and in the end has to make a good save. Word from Richard Goff to him, but the ball was along the six-yard line. A taller goalkeeper would have come for that. But in the end, it was a good stop by Gorham. Started to come and then backed away. And the shot of greater power might have beaten him. Strandley gets away. Gorham to meet him. was struck truly enough but unfortunately for him didn't find the target gets a lot of applause Frank Strandley off the crossbar and out of harm's way really hit it well harder than he needed to actually under pressure from McLaren but the goalkeeper was beaten
Early cross by McCall. McLaren. McStay. That's a good ball to Gallagher. Didn't need the extra touch, and the goalkeeper did well. Dury, goalkeeper does well again. And enormous applause for Berdiger, who's overhead, ended it, but the goalkeeper did well twice. He was very quickly at Gallagher, who didn't, although it's easy to say from here, need the extra touch. Justin Fleur is coming on to replace Tori Dalem. John Pearls get into the act. Bratset is just short of the goal line, being marked by McPherson. Two go together, McPherson one. Oh, what a good try! Really has had an impressive match, this 22-year-old from Viking Stavanger. Just couldn't keep it down, but confident to pull it from behind. Nielsen again. That's it. Oh, he's done well. He's opened them up on the left side. Well, there was a time when this man was going to come to play some football in Britain. It didn't happen. I think maybe one or two missed an opportunity. Iceland provided an early shock in the European Cup 5 World Quarter Qualifier with a 2-1 victory over Hungary. The crowd of 11,000 in the Budapest People's Stadium were delighted with their nation's start in the third minute. Kalman. Kovacs put the ball in the back of the net. However, after the fast start, the match seemed to slow down with a lack of creative play. Iceland's defence closed down well, but when Hungary did break, they missed their opportunities. The pace increased in the second half when Iceland's Oglison evened the scores in the 52nd minute. Both sides pushing for a winner. Substituted Maxison for Gresson was a good choice. Magnuson making it 2-1 for the visitors. Welcome back. That's a free kick by Gabriel Batsushta. Gave Argentina a face-saving victory over Wales yesterday in the Kirpin Cup soccer tournament in Japan. After narrowly defeating the host nation in the opening round, Argentina must have been eager for the chance to play Wales, a country that's conceded nine goals in the past two internationals. The South Americans could be rather annoyed, though, for wasting so many chances in front of 30,000 fans in the Memorial Stadium. They had 19 shots on goal compared with nine for the Welsh. However, the Welsh defence combined well enough to frustrate the runners-up of the 1990 World Cup and eventually it was a free kick that decided the match. With just one minute left before the end of regulation time, Alberto Acosta, who had been brilliant all night for Argentina, was judged to have been pushed by a trio of Welsh defenders on the edge of the penalty area. When it finally came, the 23-year-old Batsushta put home the 18-metre kick for the game's only goal. And here it comes. Outstanding. Wales now play Japan on Sunday in the final game of the preliminary round to see who plays Argentina in the final. Scotland's build-up for the European Championships continued in Norway last night, and thanks to goalkeeper Gorham, Scotland kept a lively Norwegian side at bay. Manager Andy Roxburgh had stated before the game that it was more important to avoid injuries than to avoid defeat. 
in the end they avoided both nil nil it ended let's hope for better things to come in Sweden Italy are the European under 21 champions despite losing the second leg of the final to Sweden in Haxhoi last night the Italians went into the game having won the first leg 2-0 Naturally, the Swedes were on the offensive from the start, but Italy proved steadfast in defence. Sweden finally broke through ten minutes into the second half. Simpson, the scorer. 6,000 fans making the kind of noise that only 6,000 fans can. Not very much. For this game, part of the Olympic qualifiers as well. The last eight teams through to Barcelona. Final score, Sweden 1, Italy 0. Italy win the final 2-1 on aggregate. Yeah, I went straight for my night out. And this the was game the was result of your coaching, yeah. was well, it? Well, this was it. We are 0-0 at half-time, yeah. going well. Oh, that's bad. Uh, and then 1-0 down. And then we needed to score but three. But this is where your coaching really came into its I own, said to it? these boys, look like, you whatever you do... Don't you know, go too down. <laughs> and this I, is what happened. Yes. Do you think the marking was good? I think the I, Actually, I think you've done a pretty good job with the coaching here. I well, here's me, honest. Dwight York. We yeah. Yorkie. York is uh, we know all about him anyway. Yeah. That was a lovely yeah. ball. Yeah. But by that time, of course, our boys have retired. That's from. right. Welcome to Eurosport News and tomorrow sees the start of the 1992 European Football Championships in Sweden. The hosts will take on France in Stockholm in an opening match that you can see live right here on Eurosport starting at 19.30 Central European time. Well, over the next two and a half weeks, eight nations are going to fight it out to see who will become European champion for the next four years. The competition will be divided into four stadia and two qualifying groups where teams will play each other on a round-robin basis. The winners of Group A will then take on the second in Group B in the first semi-final in Stockholm a week on Sunday, while the winners of Group B will meet the second in Group A the day after in Gothenburg. And then the final will be held in Gothenburg on Friday the 26th of June. So what about the host's chances of upsetting the form in Group A? Well, the last time Sweden hosted an event of this size was back in 1958 when the World Cup came to Scandinavia. On that occasion, Sweden made the most of home advantage to reach the final, where they lost 5-2 to Brazil, for whom a certain Pelé scored a hat-trick. Well, their coach Tommy Svensson has brought together a young squad, half of which play for clubs outside of Sweden itself. With so many uh, skillful... And one of those is 25-year-old midfielder Jonas Tern. He's very much the leader of the Swedish midfield. He's been at Benfica this season, but he's off to Napoli next year. Arsenal's Anders Limpar has proved in England that he's an excellent passer of the ball and is capable of scoring at any time. And Palmer's Thomas Brolin made a name for himself in the last World Cup. He may still be only 22 years old, but he's scored nine times in his 11 caps so far. Michel Pertini's French side qualified for Sweden with a 100% record. They are surely one of the teams with the, the best chances of winning. Platini was instrumental in France's victory on home soil back in 1984, and his squad has a fine mixture of experience and youth. Jose's Bruno Martini has proved to be a very reliable goalkeeper. He's been injured, but he's now back in top form. France's most capped player, Manuel Amaros of Marseille, will captain the side. He brings with him the experience of two World Cup finals. Another man from Marseille is Frank Soze. He'll be a key player in the French midfield. And Eric Cantona's spirits have improved immensely since his transfer to Leeds United. He's full of talent and certainly one to look out for. But the man the whole of France will pin their hopes on is Jean-Pierre Papin. The European Player of the Year is on his way to AC Milan and he'll be hoping to use this tournament as a springboard. And 32-year-old Luis Fernandez, he was the one who scored the penalty that put France into the World Cup semi-final at the expense of Brazil in 1987. England needed a late equaliser by Gary Lineker in Poland to gain their place in Sweden. And since then, manager Graham Taylor has had endless injury worries, but he can still count on a number of top-class players. And if we get those then I can't see any reason why we certainly can't reach at least the semi-final stage 
and then, as you know, any 90 minutes, anything can happen, as we saw in the World Cup in Italy. 31-year-old captain Lineker will be playing his last international matches. He needs just two goals to become the leading England goalscorer of all time. David Platt has been a revelation in Italy this year. He could well be one of the players of the tournament in Sweden. And Marseille's Trevor Steven has recently made a welcome return to the international stage. His experience will be very important to England. Well, finally in Group A, Denmark were a late replacement for Yugoslavia, and they'll be a wild card that will worry more than one international manager. They'll be counting on QPR's Peter Schmeichel in goal. And 25-year-old Fleming Poulsen has had a good season with German club Borussia Dortmund. He could be a dangerous striker to keep an eye on. And Brian Laudrup will be up there alongside him, hoping to emulate elder brother Michael's exploits in the national side. Another striker playing in Germany is 25-year-old Bent Christensen. He's had an average season with Schalke, but he's still part of a very strong Danish team to look out for. So, what about Group B? Well, Holland were very impressive when they took the European title in Germany in 1988, and many expected them to go on and win the World Cup two years later. But they were disappointing in Italy, and they'll be hoping to make up for that in Sweden. Rhinus Michaels will be calling on an experienced squad whose strong base will be formed by the 35-year-old Hans van Brucklen. Ronald Koeman will also be a key part in the Dutch lineup. He's had an excellent season with Barcelona. He's in fine form. Ruud Hullet has had terrible injury problems since the last European Championships. He's not quite at his best level at the moment, but on his day, he can turn any game around. And the Dutch will be hoping for goals from this man, Marco van Basten. He's always a danger, as he's proved over the last three years with AC Milan and Holland. Scotland may be starting as outsiders in this tournament, but they know they'll have their card to play. History has always shown that they tend to play well against the big teams, while they often lose to the minnows. They'll be playing in their first European Championships, although they have made it to the final stages of the World Cup on six occasions. I mean, you were with us when we went to the European Championships with the youth team. People said, oh, you've lost your best players, they're not going with you, if you remember boys like Eric Black and so on. Their striking lineup will be led by 29-year-old Glasgow Rangers striker Ali McCoist. He scored 12 goals in his 37 caps so far, and he'll be hoping for more in Sweden. And they also have the reliable 28-year-old Andy Gorham of Rangers playing in goal. The Commonwealth of Independent States are always the dark horses in these tournaments. Their season is over now, so their players may have had time to rest. They played well back in 1988 in Germany and are certainly worth keeping an eye on. Well, players to keep an eye on in their side are the strikers Segei Kiriakov and Igor Kolivanov. Other players to look out for in a particularly strong CIS squad are the midfielders from Manchester United, Andrei Kanchelskis, and from Glasgow Rangers, Alexei Mikhailichenko. Certainly not an outsider, the CIS. World champions Germany's preparations for Sweden took a knock last month when their inspirational captain in Italy, Lothar Matthaus, was declared unfit. Matthaus is still nursing his injury, but Germany will still go into this tournament as the team to beat.
Many of their side now play in Italy, and players to look out for include Thomas Hessler and Rudy Vuller of AS Roma. But their star of the tournament could well be 23-year-old Stefan Effenberg of Bayern Munich. There's no doubt about it, the team to beat in Sweden over the next two and a half weeks will be the Germans. Join us after the break on Eurosport News. Eurosport jedem Duplo und Hanuta das Bild eines Nationalspielers. Auf zum Sammeln! And welcome back to Eurosport News. Czechoslovakia and Austria played a friendly international last night. It was their first international of the new season for both nations and was played in the capital of Slovakia, Bratislava. Austria began the match well, scoring after 17 minutes. Czech goalkeeper Stejskal saved a shot by Artner, but the ball came clear to Stuger, who drived it home. The Austrians were soon on the move again, and in the 22nd minute, Pfeifenberger came down the left turned around the defender, Chovanek, and then put a right foot shot into the net. So 2-0 to Austria. But the home side didn't wilt under the pressure or the 35 degree heat, and they pulled one back in the 47 mi in 42nd minute, rather. A foul by Vazinger allowed Chovanek a free kick from 20 yards, which he lifted over the wall and into the corner of the net. And though Czechoslovakia worked hard throughout the second half, they had to wait until the last minute before Moravček drove home the equaliser. After that penalty had been saved, down to the last minute it went, and Moravček scoring the equaliser from the edge of the six-yard box. The final score, Czechoslovakia 2, Austria 2. Streiter Chuck und Watzinger und nur einem Stürmer, nämlich Heimo Pfeifenberger. Und in der ersten Spielhälfte, da lief das Spiel der Österreicher wirklich ganz ausgezeichnet auf vollen Touren und immer wieder über die Spielmacher wie hier Stöger oder dann Herzog, der hier drüber schießt. Ja, die größte Freude für den Trainer waren die schnellen Konterstöße von uns und das waren immer drei, vier, fünf Spieler mit. Es ist sehr einfach gespielt worden und wir waren einige Male gefährlich und er war eigentlich mehr oder weniger total begeistert. So fällt dann auch zwangsläufig der Führungstreffer für die Österreicher nach Vorarbeit von Artner. Das ist Pfeifenberger, Stöger. Er erkennt die Situation blitzartig und das 0 zu 1 in der 17. Minute. Hier noch einmal Pfeifenberger und Stöger. Da ist man auch auf der Bank ein bisschen erlöst. Ne? Ja, sicher bei jedem Tor. Für die eigene Mannschaft freut man sich. Und es gibt einem Selbstvertrauen. Hier sieht man den Pfeifenberger, wie er über halb links hineinkommt, das herrlich macht in den Ball abjagt und sehr schön einschießt. Dann steht es 2 zu 0 gegen eine Mannschaft, die eigentlich viel höher eingeschätzt worden ist vor dem Spiel, die aus lauter Legionären besteht. Und neun an der Zahl? Neun Legionäre, ja, und das lässt dann schon hoffen. Das hat der Pfeifenberger sehr schön gemacht und sehr relaxed. Ernst Happel. Ja, da war es ziemlich warm, das war sehr, sehr heiß. 30 Grad. Wir sind da im Schatten gesessen und leider haben wir da das 1 zu 2 hinnehmen müssen. Wieder einmal, wie so oft in österreichischen Länderspielen, knapp vor der Pause in der 42. Minute ein Freistoß von Chovanec und es steht nur noch 1 zu 2 aus der Sicht der GSFR. Das ist der dänische Schiedsrichter Müller Nielsen, mit dem die Österreicher dann noch unter Anführungszeichen einige Freude haben werden. Ein Foul von Chakan Moravcik und zum Pech noch elf Meter. Kubik, der Legionär, wird antreten. Ja, das war... Ein Foul vielleicht bei einer Auswärtsspiel, lasse ich mir es noch einreden. Ich glaube eher, dass es erschwollen war. Aber damit muss man leben. Der Schiedsrichter pfeift das Elfe für den Gegner. Der Kubik hat ihn aber nicht verwerten können. Den hat er herrlich abgewehrt, der Franz. Und da sieht man auch im Nachschuss einmal Glück. 
Und wir haben in, den, in diesem Spiel haben eigentlich die Gegentore zu den ungünstigsten Zeitpunkten bekommen. Knapp vor der Halbzeit das 1 zu 2. Und wie man gleich sehen wird, den Ausgleich war in der 92. Minute. Aber da muss, damit muss man halt im Fußball auch leben. Hier die gute Reaktion von Franz Wohlfahrt. Und dann lässt der dänische Schiedsrichter über die 90 Minuten spielen. Wir sind schon in der 93. Minute. Wie oft in Länderspielen dann eigentlich unverständliche Hektik in der Abwehr, Mangel an Übersicht und so fällt noch das 2 zu 2. Eigentlich unverdient, wenn man ganz ehrlich ist, auch für die Chase fair. Ja, über verdient und unverdient kann man immer debattieren, aber das Spiel dauert so lange, bis der Schiedsrichter abpfeift. Und das Spiel ist 2 zu 2 ausgegangen und damit muss man leben. Frieden. Dann geht es nach Linz zum freundschaftlichen Länderspiel gegen Portugal. Die erste Möglichkeit haben die Österreicher durch Sabica. Er spielt aus dem Mittelfeld, so wie zuletzt bei Salzburg. Hier noch einmal diese Gelegenheit, Aufsetzer per Kopf, aber über das Tor. Ja, in Linz haben wir eine super Kulisse auch gehabt. Also 14.000 Oberösterreich haben uns 90 Minuten lang angefeuert. Dementsprechend war unsere Leistung. Es war ein sehr gutes Spiel. Wir haben einige Chancen wieder gehabt. Leider nicht verwertet. Aber hier sieht man schon das 1 zu 0 durch Toni Polster nach dem Pass von Stöger Peter von der rechten Seite. Das hat er herrlich gemacht. Gibt bis seine Manier, der der Trainer wieder dazu sagen. Und lässt sie natürlich feiern in Linz. Und ich muss sagen, das Publikum hat uns wirklich sehr, sehr angesprochen. Ja, der Toni Polster hat unter Ernst Happel wirklich sehr stark gespielt in der Nationalmannschaft. Hier also noch einmal dieser Treffer zum 1 zu 0, der auch den Pausenstand bedeutet hat. Ja, da sieht man bei einem erzielten Tor von uns hat er immer ganz gerne Zigettel gehabt. In der 56. Minute dann aber der Ausgleich für die Portugiesen. Der Torschütze ist älter und hier jubelt Aguasch, der Sohn des äh, portugiesischen Internationalen der auch bei der Austria in Wien gespielt hat. Hier noch einmal dieses Tor, Endstand 1 zu 1. Und wir sehen hier wieder die technischen Daten dieses Spiels eingeblendet. 66. Spielminute, neuer Endstand 1 zu 1. Ersten WM-Qualifikationsspiel in Paris. Und alle geheimen Hoffnungen der Österreicher werden bereits in der dritten Minute durch einen Weltstar zerstört, nämlich Papin. Er schießt das 1 zu 0 unhaltbar nach Vorarbeit von Cantona für Wohlfahrt. Und ab dieser dritten Minute zerfallen alle Wünsche und Träume im österreichischen Lager. Wir haben eigentlich in diesen 90 Minuten fast keinen Zweikampf gewonnen. Das endgültige Resultat dann von 2 zu 0 durch Cantona. Widerspiegelt eigentlich nicht unsere Leistung. Wir waren sehr gefährdet, dass wir höher verlieren. Und das Spiel, glaube ich, haben wir damals sehr schnell vergessen. Und wir haben es analysiert. Es ist hauptsächlich im Zweikampfverhalten gelegen. Wir haben uns zu wenig zugetraut. Die Franzosen sind von Minute zu Minute stärker geworden, obwohl sie auch nicht eine überdurchschnittliche Leistung geboten haben. Haben auch noch einen Elfer verschossen durch Papa und dann noch das 2 zu 0 erzielt. Ja, hier lässt er sich feiern, der Kanton auch. Wir haben ihm 90 Minuten zu viel Freiraum gelassen und natürlich keine Chance gehabt. Das Risiko genommen in diesem Spiel. Die Österreicher greifen zwar von Beginn an an, aber bei Konterschlägen sind die Israelis überaus gefährlich. Wie hier bei diesem Gegenzug über den Liverpool-Legionär Rosenthal. Und das war doch einiges Glück für die Österreicher. Ja, da hätte es genauso gut 0 zu 1 stehen können. Gott sei Dank hat er den Ball nicht verwertet. Und wir sind dann immer besser ins Spiel gekommen. Wie hier, Herzog. Steiger macht es sehr gut mit dem linken Fuß, eigentlich nicht sein, aber es ist links und rechts sehr gut. Ja, und an Stöger, aber vor allem an Herzog hat sich die österreichische Mannschaft dann aufgerichtet. Der Legionär bei Bremen spielt von Beginn an stark und er wird dann auch der Mann dieses Spiels. Hier das 1 zu 0 durch Andreas Herzog, kurz vor der Pause. Er hat es super gemacht, den Ball herrlich mitgenommen und das Tor eigentlich mit dem rechten Fuß erzielt, was wiederum nicht sein Fuß wäre. Aber schauen Sie hier die Drehung, die Körpertäuschung. Hat hervorragend abgeschlossen. 
Der Andi hat in diesem Spiel wirklich eine klasse Leistung geboten und es hat ihm natürlich sehr viel geholfen, dass er in der Bundesliga sich so durchgesetzt hat. Das ist der ganzen Mannschaft zugute gekommen. Wenige Sekunden vor dem Seitenwechsel erzielt er dann auch noch den zweiten Treffer für diese österreichische Mannschaft. Hier ist er. 2 zu 0 und das war schon ein erlösendes Tor. Ich glaube, wenn da kein Halbzeitpfiff gewesen wäre, der Andi hätte in den nächsten 10 Minuten, 15 Minuten noch zwei Tore erzielt. Ihm ist da alles gelungen und er war überhaupt nicht zu halten, in keinster Weise. Und man muss auch dazu sagen, der Stöger Peter war bei jedem Tor dabei, der die Menze Laufarbeit auch verrichtet, so wie alle anderen Spieler auch. Der beruhigende Pausenstand 2 zu 0 und auch nach dem Seitenwechsel dirigiert Andreas Herzog das Spiel der Österreicher. Ja, das war eigentlich ein komisches Spiel irgendwo bei 0 zu 0, bei 3 zu 1 für uns und bei 4 zu 2 für uns waren immer irgendwie äh, gefährliche Situationen gegen uns und mit dem nötigen Glück und hier sieht man das Kopftor vom Toni, wie er sich herrlich hineinfallen lässt, nach schöner Flanke vom Stöckerbeter wieder und wir haben immer in den entscheidenden Phasen die Tore erzielt und keine bekommen, das war natürlich sehr wichtig und zum Schluss ist uns alles aufgegangen dann. Hier also dieses 3 zu 0 noch einmal, die präzise Flanke von Stöger und der Kopfball vom Polster. Dann holen die Israelis einen Treffer auf und zwar durch Zakar. Für den Turmann schwer, ich glaube, der Franz hat da überhaupt nichts gesehen. Da kann man ihm so gut wie keinen Vorwurf machen. Das zeigt auch die Zeitlupe, ein ganz genau geschossener Freistoß. Dann aber das 4 zu 1 für die Österreicher. Ogris, ein super Pass zu Stöger. Und der trifft genau ins lange Eck. Ja, das war schon ein sehr schöner Abschluss von Peter. Er hat den Ball super mitgenommen und herrlich verwertet. Und es tut ihm sehr gut, wenn er ein Tor macht. Weil er ist einer der spielbestimmenden Spieler bei uns. Es ist immer wichtig, wenn die erfolgreich abschließen. Da sieht man es in der Zeitlupe herrlich, wie er ihn mitnimmt. Einfach gestoppt und ins lange Eck geschossen. Die Österreicher jetzt einige Zeit lang wie entfesselt. Artner, Kopfballpolster, an die Lappe. Ja, in den letzten 20 Minuten hätten wir dann trotz unserer Durchhänger, die wir kurze Zeit gehabt haben, hätten wir dann noch drei, vier Tore schießen können. Chancen wären genug hier gewesen. Hier noch einmal diese sehr schöne Flanke und der Kopfball vom Polster. Aber danach kommen die Österreicher doch noch ein wenig in Bedrängnis. Und zwar nach diesem Schuss von Zaka, der den zweiten Treffer für die Israelis bedeutet. Und da hat der Franz Wohlfahrt nicht gut ausgesehen. Ja, bei solchen Toren schaut der Tormann immer schlecht aus. Der Ball ist hier vor ihm versprungen. Ich glaube, in der Zeitlupe sieht man es jetzt genau. Und es ist halt auch so, dass er, wenn er Feldspieler einen Fehler macht, kann man ihn wieder ausbessern. Und der Tormann, den Tormann, seine Fehler sind nicht mehr auszubessern. Und in diesem Fall schaut der Tormann nicht gut aus, obwohl ich glaube, dass es jedem Tormann passieren könnte. Den Österreichern gelingt dann aber noch der fünfte Treffer der Torschütze, ist jetzt der Kapitän Andreas Ogris. So herrlich verwertet, gleich direkt, ohne dass ich den Ball mitgenommen hat und den Pass hat wieder der Stöger Peter gegeben und man sieht schon, dass uns da fast alles gelungen ist in diesem Spiel. Österreichs Team feiert also einen klaren 5 zu 2 Erfolg im letzten Spiel unter Ernst Happel, der von seiner Krankheit schon schwer gezeichnet ist. Und mit einer Spitze, Dietmar, haben Sie die Mannschaft aufs Feld geschickt. 
Ja, es, wir haben gewusst, dass die Deutschen natürlich zu Hause sehr schwer zu spielen sind. Der Druck des äh, Todes vom Trainer war für die Deutschen überhaupt nicht gegeben. Es war, wir waren alle traurig, dass das passiert ist. Dass in den Medien hochgespielt worden ist, was das in Deutschland auch sehr traurig sind, das habe ich von Anfang an nicht geglaubt. Es ist sicher, seine Freunde haben damit äh, gekämpft durch sein Ableben, aber das Spiel gegen Deutschland ist immer 100 zu führen, das ist eine Prestige-Sache. Das ist nicht einmal ein Freundschaftsspiel, weil der Sieger häckelt den Verlierer und wir sind immer die Kleinen gegen die Großen. Und wir haben aber sehr stark angefangen und gewusst, da brauchen wir uns nicht verstecken. Es wurde hart gespielt, hier die gelbe Karte für Michael Streiter nach einem Foul an Doll. Die Österreicher haben überhaupt den Kampf mit den Deutschen aufgenommen und die kamen eigentlich nur wie hier durch Hessler bei den Standardsituationen zu ihren Chancen. Ja, wir haben das Spiel der Deutschen analysiert. Sie haben zwei gute Stürmer, zwei offensive Leute, halb links, halb rechts im Mittelfeld. Zwei gute Außenspieler, links und rechts. Wenn wir die stoppen, haben wir, uns, haben wir gewusst, können wir gut ausschauen. Ich habe den Spielern gesagt, wir können das Spiel sogar gewinnen. Vielleicht haben sie mir das gar nicht geglaubt am Anfang, aber nach dem Spiel haben sie es dann gewusst, dass es möglich gewesen wäre. Und diese Frechheit und Unbekümmertheit der Österreicher, die führt dazu, dass die Österreicher in der zweiten Spielhälfte manchmal sogar mehr Spielanteile haben und immer wieder Gefahr für das Tor von Köpke bedeuten. Hier ein Schuss von Stöger und knapp daneben auf Seiten der Österreicher Michael Konsel nun im Tor statt Franz Wolfer. Ich wollte alle beide spielen lassen, weil äh, diese zwei Torleute eigentlich die Torleute des äh, Trainers waren das ganze Jahr hindurch. Und es haben sich beide verdient, dass sie bei dieser Veranstaltung in der Auslage stehen. Und Konsel kann sich gleich auszeichnen. Freistoß nach einem Foul, wieder von Streiter an Klinsmann. Eine der Möglichkeiten für die Deutschen. Sehr viel nach Vorpeitschen, glaube ich, muss man die Österreicher nicht. Der Wille war da, um irgendwie auch ein Vermächtnis für Ernst Happel anzustreben. Ja, das ist auch das Wichtigste bei uns. Bei uns muss nur das Selbstvertrauen da sein. Das ist der Andi Herzog hat. Der sich da herrlich durchgespielt hat zwischen zwei Verteidiger. Wenn wir das Selbstvertrauen haben und äh, die Überzeugung, dass wir gut sind, können wir wirklich gegen jeden gewinnen. Und das ist leider in letzter Zeit oft nicht der Fall gewesen. Hier sieht man noch die Chance vom Ogri Sandi. Er war aber zu der Zeit schon im Abseits. Er hat sowieso nicht gegolten. Aber man hat in der zweiten Halbzeit gesehen, dass wir immer öfter vor das gegnerische Tor gekommen sind. Dann noch Aufregung in den Schlussphasen dieses Spiels, eine Attacke von Kirsten an Torhüter Michael Konsel und der äh, empörte Peter Adner stößt Kirsten zu Boden, der lässt sich fallen und Schiedsrichter Worrell aus England schließt beide aus. Ja, wenn man es da sieht, so in der Zeitlupe, dann ist der Peter, glaube ich, hat sich ausgeschlossen worden. Zuerst ist, glaube ich, der Stöger Peter zu ihm hingegangen, zum Kirsten, hat ihm aber nur leicht gerempelt und der Peter geht dann wirklich zielstrebig auf ihn hin. Er fällt sehr leicht, der Junge, muss man schon sagen. Oder war sicher die Angst um Michael Konsel sehr groß bei Peter Adner? Ja, es war das vielleicht etwas zu viel, wie der Peter das gemacht hat. Wir haben aber gesagt vor dem Spiel, wir lassen uns nichts gefallen heute. Wir werden dagegen halten, wir dürfen nicht kleiner werden, wenn die Deutschen mit uns zum Streiten anfangen. Und er hat ihn ein bisschen zu stark verteidigt, den Konsel Michel, der aber sicher sehr schwer verletzt worden wäre, wenn ihm der Schlag von Kirsten getroffen hätte. Berti Vogts, der gegnerische Coach, wirft dann noch Möller ins Spiel. Ja, die Deutschen haben natürlich versucht, mit aller Gewalt ein Tor zu erzielen. Es ist ihnen Gott sei Dank nicht gelungen, aber da sind sie selber die Schuld. Dafür können wir wirklich nicht sorgen. Und so läuft es eben manchmal, wie es im Fußball läuft. Den Matchball haben dann die Österreicher nach einem herrlichen Konter. Kommt dann der Ball schließlich zu Polster. Hier Chuck Stöger allein auf der linken Seite, flankt mit dem linken Fuß. Und solche Bälle hat der Toni normalerweise rein. Ja, er hat vor dem Spiel nicht das große Selbstvertrauen gehabt, wie immer, aber das kann passieren. Es wäre natürlich schön, wenn er das Tor macht, aber es ist genauso wie für den Gegner, zählt auch für uns. Es ist nicht jede Chance ein Tor und leider ist der Ball halt nicht ins Tor gegangen, aber damit können wir leben, mit dem 0 zu 0 in Deutschland.